Tere, labadien, sveiki, hello, salu. Uh, welcome to this very virtual but very real and very live uh, conference about uh, data and data economy. I'm really glad that uh, three ICT uh, associations, Infobalt, Ligta from Latvia, ITL from Estonia, we are organizing this conference and uh, uh, asking and raising these questions about data and data economy in, uh, in the Baltics. Uh, the conference is streamed via Teams uh, streaming and also is streamed in Lithuania, Delf Delphi, Lithuania, in Estonia, Delphi, Estonia, and in Latvia, TVNet and LMT Straume. So uh, it's an uh, event where we want to ask questions and also uh, share the ideas how to tackle the 21st century oil, or as somebody says, uh, I mean data and data e economy. Uh, some are saying that it's oil, some are saying that it's uh, sun. It's uh, uh, reusable, it's uh, if, uh, re reusable, uh, recyclable, and uh, the more we use, the better we get. So uh, we, need to, we need to look how to approach this question and also what Baltic states can do in order to become a leaders in the European Union on data economies. Uh, why it is important that we are not closing the borders on uh, in our own countries, because the more data, the better. It means that uh, it has an effect that if you are sharing it, you are getting more and more value. So I believe that uh, we will be asking these questions and also uh, finding some answers uh, during today's session and today's conference. So the conference is, uh, is made by stages. So first stage is the keynote speakers, and then we will have three panel discussions uh, where the different uh, speakers and moderators will be trying to get the answers to, to the questions and also looking for the way forward in Baltics and in uh, European Union. Uh, we, are op uh, we are very often talking about uh, data privacy. We will tackle that question. We are also talking about uh, data interoperability. We, will, we need to ask these questions. We also are talking about open data. I believe that we will have answers uh, and questions about that. So for the audience, I would encourage you who are uh, watching us via Teams, uh, please ask questions and uh, moderators and myself, we will be able to ask our keynote speakers and presenters uh, in, and uh, that will make our discussions even more live than uh, then it would be only one uh, one way streaming. So uh, taking these notes, I believe that uh, we are on the forefront in Baltics and uh, using the data. But uh, recent pandemic situation now we are only uh, one year after we are discussing how to introduce the data exchange on the vaccinated people or so called immune passport. So that's the we could have done it beforehand. Uh, I don't understand also why, as an example, uh, if I want to open the bank account in Poland or if I want to open bank account in, in another country, it takes sometimes the process up to three months on uh, know your customer procedure. It could be solved by sharing the data among the countries in, in the Baltics, among the countries in European Union. So it's not only about the private data, but it's also about business data. And not, nevertheless, it's also about the governmental and state institutions data, which could travel and make our uh, travel across the borders and make our lives and uh, services uh, provided to us better, easier and un flourish. So what's, what's the steps uh, are planned or what's the steps should be planned? Uh, we will be discussing in this uh, conference uh, and, uh, and I hope that we will have not only questions and answers, I hope after that we will have a real plan what's the next steps and how to make it happen and how to make it uh, uh, bring, how, how the data economy will make us wealthy and healthy. So I would like to uh, give a floor for, for our uh, first keynote spe uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister of Entrepreneurship and Internet, uh, Information Technology of Estonia, Mr. Anders Sutt. Tere. 
So I hope that Estonia has a lot to, uh, what to share in, uh, in, the, in the IT industry, but also when it comes to the data flows and interoperability, uh, you will have a very nice presentation and a keynote speech. So Anders, the floor is yours. Aš nieko negirdžiu. Well, uh, opportunities uh, help to bring people in a way much easier together uh, globally, regionally and uh, let's make uh, the most out of it. Uh, I'm confident times will return when we can also meet in person, but in the meanwhile, let's, uh, let's stay connected. And uh, of course, uh, digital transformation is part of, uh, of uh, three major uh, transformations uh, we are facing as societies, as businesses, uh, uh, the green transition, uh, digital transformation, the innovation uh, drive. Uh, and, and that's why it's really important that we will push hard and uh, effectively with a digital trans uh, transformation uh, so that we will emerge from a crisis in Europe uh, stronger, uh, the prosperity, security, competitiveness of our, of our countries uh, and well-being of our societies uh, will be better. And that this is also reflected in, in the Commission's work uh, and their uh, digital decade uh, declaration, what uh, they presented uh, just a while ago. Uh, and and uh, there is very, very clear uh, direction uh, lined out. Oh. Uh, so we must foster digital single market. We know that uh, the single market for good services people has been uh, and capital has been for, uh, for, uh, for decades, but now it's really important to go also uh, forward digitally. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the critical infrastructures uh, and technologies uh, are resilient and secure and uh, and it's really time for digitization of uh, governments and, uh, and uh, to build trust and foster digital innovation because trust I think is really the key in uh, in all this setup. Uh, I think uh, like it was mentioned in, uh, in intro uh, the three Baltic states, uh, we have an opportunity to become a leader in the EU on integrated data economy uh, and we need to be uh, setting our ambition high and, uh, and start the transition to the real-time economy so that we will get uh, data moving freely and in real time uh, that uh, there is a good and smooth uh, cooperation uh, of uh, e-governments across the Baltic states and I think most importantly uh, we need a change in our mindset uh, that uh, companies and uh, governments can really move uh, towards a data-driven economy. And COVID is just a, a, a big uh, speeder or, uh, or, or facilitator in, uh, in, in this uh, process. Uh, I, I give you just one example. Uh, uh, in Estonia, the uh, e-invoicing is mandatory in uh, uh, business to government uh, transactions and it's about 97 percent uh, usage uh, rate then we go to business to business transactions uh, the, the share of e invoicing is only 30 to 40 percent so there is a huge gap uh, what can be closed and of course uh, 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 it's part of a mindset uh, change what i spoke about but uh, but i think uh, it, it's also important uh, to uh, to really unleash the, the benefits um, uh, the, the benefits of uh, uh, of a data-driven uh, e economy and uh, I think it's also a case that this innovation tiger in our societies has kind of fallen asleep and we must uh, awake this tiger up to be ready uh, again to take more risks in order to get uh, better outcomes, better results and, and uh, not to be afraid of doing the things in a, in a new way. So if we can switch the next slide please. Sometimes technology works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, here we go. Very good. So, uh, 
so what is standing on our way? Uh, I would say we we face like a three core challenges. Uh, there are many services which are already working, uh, but there are a huge number of cases uh, where uh, data is not uh, exchanged across borders uh, in real time, uh, nor in an automated way. So, and this in turn uh, results in a huge administrative burden. Uh, the quality of data is uneven, uh, and the, all the manual data analytics uh, takes a lot of uh, time and money. So, what do we need? from a technical point of view, is firstly uh, to, uh, to use different, uh, the problem is that we use different sem semantic models and the data is not commonly understandable. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, we, we need to get rid of uh, 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 ununified approach uh, to data uh, standardization and instead uh, uh, get a more unified approach uh, uh, so we can really uh, say that uh, the once only principle would work in practice and that would be a real driver for uh, for the economy uh, for a data economy uh, we need to share uh, and uh, reuse data which i think is also part of a green uh, transition uh, and then obviously you will see uh, real savings for uh, businesses and, and governments alike uh, and the second challenge we face is not always uh, data is uh, timely, so we need to get uh, timeliness uh, back on the table. Uh, for, it's important for uh, businesses, uh, uh, it's important for innovation. Uh, and uh, here I think, uh, again, uh, it's not that much of a technological issue because, uh, uh, for example, Estonian-born data exchange layer Rixroad works. However, there needs to be also uh, a wider uh, political drive to share data in real time and across borders. Yes, due consideration should be given to data protection, data privacy, but uh, we shouldn't uh, really approach it in a way uh, uh, that data is not flowing. Rather, we should uh, find ways within the framework uh, that would enable us to, to move data across borders and, and real, uh, real time. So thirdly, uh, of course, uh, data oftentimes cannot be uh, exchanged in machine-readable way, uh, and that is a major obstacle. Uh, uh, so this is uh, what we have to change uh, to work jointly in developing and connecting uh, data sharing infrastructures uh, and to achieve actual uh, interoperability uh, of data so that it can really flow seamlessly uh, between the different uh, authorities. So uh, moving ahead uh, on a real-time economy concept, uh, I think uh, this is one of the tools uh, what uh, can help us really to overcome the data constraints and, and the problems we face. Uh, and, uh, of course, the main idea of a real-time um, uh, economy is to uh, enable and create a real-time business environment uh, in which the administration, ad administrative operations and uh, financial transactions will be created and processed uh, automatically in real-time, in standardized form, so we can, in a good way, forget uh, the paperwork. Uh, Again, uh, I think it's important uh, that the content of data uh, does not change. Uh, it is only the technical form uh, of a data and the way of entering, transmitting, uh, uh, exchanging it uh, will change. So we, we will move from paper and PDF documents and reports to machine readable data. So in a way, it's, it's kind of ironic if, uh, if we send some uh, scanned PDF formats uh, from machine to machine which is kind of uh, halfway, or maybe not even halfway, in, in truly digitalizing the, the whole value chain. Uh, so I think also conceptually, if we think what do we uh, create and send, is it reports or data, and there is a fundamental difference uh, between the two. So we should really focus on sending and, uh, and reporting data and not the forms. Uh, so there are uh, examples and this estimates uh, in, in Estonia uh, for um, uh, uh, for how much it uh, it could be saved uh, in um, 
uh, in moving to real da uh, real time data exchange. And uh, by some estimates, we could save in Estonia over 200 million uh, euros per year, which is roughly equivalent to 14 million working hours. So it's a lot. Uh, and, and that basically implies if we could uh, move uh, to real time uh, uh, economy and data exchange in, through the e invoices, uh, uh, e receipts, uh, e uh, C, uh, CMR. Uh, so these all combined uh, would give us actually significant uh, savings. Finland has estimated that in their case, uh, the savings uh, to from the shift to e-receipts could yield to some 900, uh, uh, 900 million uh, euros per year. Uh, and it also helps to reduce the carbon footprint uh, and lower the company's operational costs. And, and also uh, reduce lost sales. So that is a huge, huge benefit. Uh, what what is uh, what is already uh, visible uh, through the different uh, analytics. Uh, it it should also make life easier for SMEs uh, and and to help reducing their administrative burdens and bureaucracy. Uh, and uh, if we can uh, really implement once only principle and machine readable interoperability, uh, uh, SMEs or bigger companies can really focus on business growth and increase uh, their productivity. Uh, so, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the validity of the data protection rules uh, should remain the same and, uh, and compliance need to be effective. Uh, so uh, as the company is then itself uh, who decides with whom and uh, and what data it, it will share and we are not starting from uh, from zero because uh, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania together with the Nordic countries uh, have already taken a joint uh, international initiative uh, towards a real-time economy implementation uh, and for example we have successfully developed uh, and tested an electronic uh, consignment note, uh, ECMR, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and the prototype solution between uh, the Baltics, uh, which has already uh, been working, uh, has been also rec recognized uh, wider in the EU. So uh, the second thing, electronic authentication, uh, digital signing uh, and uh, and existing pilot projects, uh, including uh, e-invoicing, e-received, know your customer, which was mentioned in uh, in, in financial world, uh, clearly uh, hugely beneficial if we can move to real-time uh, economy uh, setup uh, uh, and more uh, timely data accuracy and data use uh, would help financial sector and correspondingly the businesses. Uh, ECMR already uh, mentioned. So we, we, we really have to continue to build on, uh, on, on these uh, advances uh, and, uh, and we can extend it to uh, e-accounting, uh, real-time payments, which actually are already uh, uh, available uh, in the euro area, e-reporting, e-registers, e-payroll and, and you name it. So it will uh, be really possible to, uh, to change business activities uh, and move away from uh, paper and uh, uh, PDF format uh, to uh, free real-time activities in uh, and fully digital and uh, and electronic way, mm. and uh, equally uh, we we have uh, shown our interest in in the Baltic region uh, to develop a real-time economy ecosystem, uh, and why not to join forces and uh, build the real-time economy flagship project uh, and ecosystem uh, in the entire Baltic uh, Sea region. Uh, just to, to give you uh, a tangible example, uh, I will uh, walk you through the, the ECMR, uh, which was developed during the COVID crisis when there was uh, high demand for uh, reducing unnecessary human contacts uh, in cargo uh, collections and delivery activities. Uh, and as you may know, uh, about 99% of cross-border transport operations in the EU uh, still involve uh, paper-based documents. So together with Latvia, Lithuania and Poland, uh, we managed to develop and test an electronic uh, consignment note, uh, ECMR, uh, at the end of uh, 2020. 
uh, in order to achieve uh, cross-border exchange uh, of uh, ES, ECM, uh, e, um, CMR information uh, by setting up uh, an indexing, indexing scheme uh, between the countries. Uh, and we plan to go further with neighboring countries by uh, creating pan-European interoperable uh, system. Uh, there is actually uh, a good video which I would like you now to start uh, so you can actually see how it uh, is operating in, in practice. So if, uh, if you could start the video, it uh, would be great now. To test and prove the potential of paperless road transport in Europe. European logistics is a tremendous challenge. Today, hundreds of thousands of shipments are incorporated daily. It is the true backbone of our economy. All this movement of goods is accompanied by a large amount of documentation. The most important one is consignment note or CMR document. Until recently, the CMR documentation was only used in the form of paper, making it time consuming as well as costly to proceed them. With this prototype, the documents can be first checked remotely through the register and then, if needed, the physical check may be done. In such a way, only suspicious or critical trucks would be stopped. The solution for ECMR cross-border exchange is indexing. Every shipment's electronic document is created by a service provider. The ECMR with the truck and trailer number is transmitted to the index registry. All index documents I don't hear are it, but I, I see it. locked and encrypted with blockchain technology. The national indexes interact with each other. When information about goods being transported is needed, the request can be made to one single query environment. For that, a police, border guard or tax and customs officer enters the truck or trailer number to the system and gets to see the ECMR information on their screens. In the prototype, the option of using distributed ledger solution was successfully tested and the advantages included the creation of a decentralized database and high transparency. The ECMR is an opportunity to improve and simplify business communication with public authorities in the areas of control operations, taxation, reporting and statistics. This is the Gino Proto ECMR cross-border prototype. A result of an excellent cooperation between partners from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland. The solution is contributing to fast, transparent and efficient. So, uh, let's be ambitious and work uh, towards achieving uh, data exchange in real time uh, and across borders, because this would really help us uh, moving forward and emerge from the crisis uh, stronger. Uh, there are several steps what we, we need to take. And, uh, and of course, the first one, uh, uh, we, we should be ready uh, uh, and still embrace the globalization. Uh, every day we see more and more uh, companies doing business abroad and let's make it easy for them not only nationally, but also across uh, borders to use the databases uh, and, uh, and, and work uh, in an uh, efficient and digital way. Uh, cooperation, secondly, uh, very important. Uh, uh, and there has to be a political will uh, for the digital transition. Uh, here in Estonia, this uh, is very strong. We really want to uh, move forward. Uh, we want to move fast. Uh, and uh, a key, of course, for success is that we can do it only not nationally, but also across the borders, so that the public and private e-services really function in interoperable way. The third point, and I think for me this is probably the key, we need a mindset, uh, mindset change uh, at, at the level of companies and at the level of government, uh, governments, uh, so that we can uh, move towards data-driven economy. Uh, and uh, we don't have to really reinvent the wheel. Uh, so let's integrate the already existing uh, and good solutions on the market, increase their interoperability and get the data moving freely, automatically and in, uh, in re real time. Uh, for example, uh, since last year, Estonia and Finland uh, are exchanging certain business registry uh, information cross-border. Uh, via the X road, and this is just one example. And we should also pilot new services. Uh, every project started should be addressed for the regional, 
if not at the EU level uh, from the beginning and should be able to exchange data across databases uh, and, and, port, uh, and borders. Support with SMEs is important uh, and of course the common uh, real economy principles. This is what we, we, we need, to, uh, need to agree. Discuss. Sur Aita, Mr. Minister. Uh, Thank you very much. You set the stage very, very perfectly. It seems that there is a lot to gain and only our, how to say, uh, not moving fast enough is preventing us to deliver it. So I take your words as a, you know, as a start uh, shoot. And now let's uh, commonly build this uh, leadership in EU or in the Baltic region. So thank you once again, Sur Aita. And uh, now we will be moving to our next uh, keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Kasper Klinge, uh, Vice Minister of Microsoft European Government Affairs. And uh, Microsoft is processing huge amounts of data and I'm more than sure that they have what to share with us. Hi, Kaspers. introduction i am not a minister i have to uh, sort of come clean on that one <laughs> uh, but uh, but it was very very nice of you to say that um listen I, I thought i would i would begin by um telling you how difficult it is for me to actually do this speech because you know i am danish as my accent will reveal and there are very few countries around the world where we consider ourselves to be a little bit the big brother because we are a very small country ourselves but we've always had this feeling with the baltic states and then when you see the Baltic states overtake you, become more digitalized, become more European, become more progressive in, in the areas that we're going to discuss, it, that is just very difficult for, for Dane. So I think at the end of, uh, of my, uh, my point, you should add 20% on top because it is difficult for me to really give you all the credit that I think you deserve uh, in, in this area. And um, listen, I think in many ways, uh, I sit in, in Brussels uh, and uh, and we take, of course, a look on, on what is happening in, in Europe. And this is very much also about how we as a company can align uh, our technology, our products, uh, our responsibility to where the world is, but also where Europe uh, is today. And I, I don't want to be uh, pessimistic. I don't want to be uh, too alarmistic, but I, I honestly believe that Europe is at a pretty important point um, and I'm not only talking about uh, our continued uh, struggles with fighting the global pandemic. And again, sitting here in Brussels, uh, we are unfortunately far from at the end of this, uh, uh, this fight. Uh, we will probably see additional lockdowns coming through here in, in Belgium in the next couple of days. And um, what I'm talking about is I think there is a fundamental uh, choice to be made on where Europe is going to head. And I do think that digitalization and technology is, is going to be one of the key parameters. So if you allow me to fast forward to, to basically my conclusion and in, in my introductory remark, um, that is that I think we need a bigger uh, Baltic voice in Europe. I think we need to bring uh, the view, the approach to technology and digitalization coming out of the three Baltic countries uh, much, more, um, much more vocally into the discussions that are happening also here in, in Brussels. And the reason I'm saying this is that I do think that when you combine um, the way we've been struggling with COVID-19, both in the recovery phase, trying to overcome the contraction of our economies, retaining jobs, rebuilding jobs, uh, whether you look at the dependency on uh, technology, and let's be honest here, uh, a lot of technology is not necessarily coming out of Europe. Um, but also when you combine that with, I think, a concern also with social media platforms, the role it plays also in, in terms of, uh, of democracy more writ large. I do think that that is one of the reasons why we're seeing perhaps renewed momentum around uh, digital sovereignty in, in Europe or strategic autonomy, as others might uh, call it. And I, and I think there are in many ways uh, two ways you can look at the digital sovereignty discussion in Europe. Um, the, the first one is to acknowledge that there are good reasons why Europe is preoccupied with this. You know, I'm a European with a, with a capital E. I understand why European decision makers are 
incredibly focused on making sure that Europe will remain competitive, that Europe will remain in a position to take decisions independently. Um, I also understand why it is that there is such a big focus on making sure that we support the broader ecosystem of entrepreneurship, uh, startups, that we become better at scaling uh, the companies. And I was just looking at some of the data sets in, in these areas, and I think that's one of the areas where the Baltic countries are uh, doing much better than most of Europe, uh, both when you look at sort of the DC index on, on the degree of digitalization, but actually also when you look at the number of entrepreneurs per capita, I think the Baltic countries are, are really examples to, to be followed. And I had the, I had the opportunity to live in, in Silicon Valley for uh, a little more than three years. And uh, for whatever it's worth, just an, on an anecdotal basis, I mean, two of my neighbors uh, were from the Baltic countries. And I think I see uh, Leva on the call here. So she will remember one of the dinners we had in one of the houses. <laughs> the first dinner I think I had with, uh, with a former president, by the way. And um, perhaps that's where the confusion about me being a, a vice minister came into the equation. But I think the main point here is that the Baltic countries punch above weight. And that's certainly also my experience living in, in Silicon Valley. We, we saw a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of uh, colleagues from, uh, from the Baltic states doing really well. And I think that spirit is something we need to learn on uh, across uh, Europe. I think on the digital sovereignty discussion, it is also just uh, enormously important that we don't turn um, the desire to be in control and to take decisions independently into a, 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 a trajectory towards sort of more inward looking, perhaps, you know, touching around protectionism. I think it is incredibly important that Europe will remain loyal to its history, to its legacy, uh, open markets focusing on global trade and making sure that Europe will benefit from uh, state of the art technology also in the broader scheme of things. And I think that's one of the areas where the regulatory freight train coming out of Brussels these uh, years, um, in our case, we, we think that more than 40 pieces of regulation will have a direct impact on our ability to do business in, in Europe. Um, and in some ways, they're going to make our life more difficult. Let's be honest about that. But I think fundamentally, this is about also holding companies to account and making sure that we have standards based on European values holding everybody into account, whether this is on protecting democracy or whether it's on ensuring that we fly, fight the climate change and become more uh, sustainable. So the digital sovereignty debate, I think, is, is one of the most decisive discussions uh, across Europe right now. But it's also one of those discussions where I do think that it is important that we have 27 member states uh, speaking up, helping to define what that means uh, in practice. And if you look at it from a historical point of view, I think where Europe has always excelled uh, through history, going all the way back to the Westphalian peace, is to have a dynamic view on on uh, on sovereignty, basically adapting it to the time that uh, that we live in. Uh, in many ways, I think the European Union is a direct response to a particular challenge around sovereignty uh, after the Second World War. And in many ways, I think the world will be looking towards Europe in finding a way to define you know, sovereignty in the digital age where, whether we like it or not, the world is more interdependent. Our technologies connect us, data flows will become uh, incre increasingly important. And it is going to be important that we have a sovereignty concept that is really adapted to, to the time uh, of, of our age. And that's one of the areas where we think and we uh, are firmly believing that Europe will play an incredibly important role, not only for Europe, but actually also with the Brussels effect, influence of the thinking around the world, because after all, who does not want digital sovereignty? I think if you travel to New Delhi and ask that question, I'm pretty sure that uh, Indians would also like uh, digital sovereignty. I'm sure the same would, would apply in, in Latin America or in Southeast Asia. But I think Europe will be first in defining what this means in practice. And I think that debate is taking place uh, right now. Um, we've seen a couple of letters in the last uh, couple of weeks from uh, different heads of states and government across Europe. Um, and I think what was interesting is not only the fact that you had two letters within eight days, but also that both letters were really about the digital sovereignty concept and the necessity of finding the right way forward in a balanced way. And I think that says a, a bit about why it is that we need to invest in, in this concept. Just wrapping up before we go to, uh, to the panel debate, um, what does that mean for a company like Microsoft? Um, I think it means that we have to be even more thoughtful 
uh, something we are trying to do uh, every single day. Um, it also means that we have to make sure that our technology is really aligned with where Europe wants to head, whether we talk about data residency, whether we talk about uh, security measures, whether we talk about privacy issues, we have to make sure that we develop and deploy technology that is really fit for where Europe is, is, is heading. And that will require us to take some difficult decisions. It might also require us to uh, adapt uh, our technologies in a way that it's currently not in all areas. But I think that's the kind of, of partnership that we are envisaging uh, with Europe as we as we move ahead and something that we think we can we can expect from from everybody else. Let me finish up here and just thank you very much for for having me uh, on on the panel today as well. For uh, making a broader view on uh, what is going on in all the Europe and uh, of the Baltic's ambition to become leaders of data economies. It's yeah, it is limited by the EU ambition to become. Uh, protectionist or to open economy as well. So that's uh, that, that's a very right uh, flavor to our discussion. And I believe that uh, we, we can move now to the first panel discussion. And uh, this is the, uh, the discussion is exactly about the topic data sovereignty, pros and cons, open data, GDPR restrictions, potential, and it's uh, will be hosted by Ms. Eva Ilves, uh, uh, advisor of the president of Latvia uh, for information and digital policy. Uh, yes, uh, good morning and um, it's my pleasure. Uh, can you hear me well? It's all working? Yes, yes. Excellent. So uh, it's my pleasure and uh, it's my honor to join the, the very esteemed panel, which I will introduce in a minute. And then uh, hello to Casper. Yes, indeed. <laughs> the last time, which seems so long ago, but nowadays we rarely meet people in person anyway. Uh, we met uh, indeed in Silicon Valley and had quite a bit of discussions of uh, actually Baltic, Nordic and European challenges. Uh, so um, uh, let me let me just uh, briefly outline uh, how I see uh, the panel and the topic, and then I will give uh, give a floor to a few statements uh, from the panelists for 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 their perspective, and then uh, let's let's move to the actually lively debate. So um, we already heard uh, quite a, quite impressive and good uh, presentations from from uh, keynote speakers introducing the topic. I think nobody doubts uh, the, the role and need of data, and we hear we need more data, we need better data, we we need live data, and uh, there is a lot of. Um, emphasis certainly on the topic. Somehow I have a intuition uh, that the topic that we are having on this panel data sovereignty uh, is a bit like a, maybe an elephant in a room and uh, everybody understands it's big and it's important yet we are extremely all careful uh, sort of to ha handle it carefully not to break uh, so to say more china on the shelves so um, let's see how far we can get on this topic uh, knowing uh, the the necessity and the need of the data and i think uh, the european commission uh, has put out quite a bit of thinking in that direction. We have uh, a European data strategy already about a year ago out, uh, I think outlining all of the aspects and ch challenges very sort of uh, in a holistic manner. I think it also um, uh, puts emphasis already on a number of concrete initiatives or sectors to focus on, on EU data spaces to advance uh, uh, European data services in certain uh, critical sectors like healthcare, like agriculture, energy, green deal, mobility, and others. Uh, we have seen also Data Governance Act coming out, uh, speaking about uh, how we deal with the data and how we manage the data. So a lot of a uh, lot of documentations, a lot of food for uh, food for thought, and also uh, and also regulation coming out how to handle so the data. So um, uh, while looking through that, uh, uh, a lot of uh, a big scope, uh, many topics, I do not see, however, much of uh, sovereignty per se uh, addressed in the in the documents. Let's put it that way. But we do hear that word, and rightly, Casper already mentioned that uh, in debates, in publications, in in considerations when we speak about data. So. Um, 
let's see if we can in this uh, very ex esteemed panel and i'm sure uh, people with expertise from different uh, perspectives and work uh, grasp what do we mean and then again casper uh, lightly touched this uh, question what do we mean with data sovereignty do we see that as an opportunity or uh, rather do we see a contradiction for uh, actually is that aim to get more data, better data working for us. Is there, a, what are those challenges there? And I think what particularly we want to have, we want to have a focus and perspective from the Baltic states for the smaller states. Uh, I can imagine in a very tri trivial way that maybe a small state means less data. And the question for us is really that data sharing and access to global data is vital uh, for our uh, services to be developed, uh, for our businesses. So I'm really interested um, to invite my dear panelists uh, as I will give a floor one by one to each of you speak here, uh, maybe to give your uh, five minute perspective of what do you think from, from where you sit, from where you work, from your national perspective, and also probably in the context of, of European policy, what do you think and understand of data sovereignty? How do you uh, see that working in overall uh, those uh, aims uh, we already mentioned in the morning opening, whether that's something to facilitate, whether that's something as an abst obstacle, or whether there we see a clear path how this all sort of works for each other. And with that, uh, with that, my uh, quick uh, introduction, uh, uh, let me uh, let me move to the uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I will start with uh, our hosts, <laughs> uh, Lithuanians. I will invite uh, Mrs. Egle Markevičiute, Vice Minister of Lithuanian Ministry of Economy and Innovation. And then uh, I will follow up with, uh, with my Latvian colleagues, uh, with Kasper and with the colleagues from Estonia. So if I might, uh, if I may, do I see Mrs. Markevičiute in, in um, screen? Yes, I'm here. You are more than welcome to share your perspective and let's uh, let's uh, let's kick off the debate and uh, unwrap this uh, uh, maybe a complicated question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Labadian, uh, Labadiana Tera. It is a pleasure to be um, at this conference speaking on behalf of Lithuania. And uh, when it comes to um, data sovereignty, the questions that uh, uh, were uh, presented to us are definitely very important. Um, however, we, uh, when it comes to data sovereignty, uh, we are, uh, as Lithuania, no doubt in favor but we probably need to agree on what that means at the beginning. Uh, first of all, uh, it surely means having complete control uh, and it probably doesn't matter in what uh, infrastructure we hold it and in what geographical location is the infrastructure. Um, as long as we are confident that uh, the security of uh, the data is ensured, uh, the access to it is fully controlled, and we can say that the sovereignty of our data is uh, guaranteed. Um, however, these tasks in the virtual world are secured by virtual means. Uh, therefore, it is important to identify uh, which measures are actually necessary to ensure control and um, essential to put in place uh, the necessary mechanisms and tools. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it is still quite common to realize that uh, the sovereignty of cyberspace uh, can be secured by physical means, and we have to um, do a lot of work to get there. Um, when within the EU, in order to achieve a digital single market, uh, we certainly uh, need to create a culture of trust uh, and not to create artificial barriers between the member states. But uh, at the same time, we must remain as open as possible to technologies and services coming from outside the EU. So uh, in order not to be isolated from technological progress and innovation. However, there is uh, always a need to manage the risks of the potential impact of external regulation on our data control. 
So um, to conclude my uh, my first five minutes or a little bit less, um, we we can definitely see that the recent uh, developments in the world, including including COVID-19, have illustrated the need pro for preserving an open economy. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we have to ensure as both Baltic states, individual states, the EU, uh, we have to distance ourselves from considering strict prohibitive measures as well, uh, such as unjustified data localization requ requirements or measures of similar nature. Um, so that would be my, my first thoughts on data sovereignty. Ekla, thank you very much. I think uh, it's uh, already sort of uh, numbers some of challenges. I think you also underlined a very, uh, very um, uh, important aspect, the control, the, that uh, we control our data. And that's probably also something that uh, might require some, some uh, continuous uh, perspective. What do we mean by that? And how do we ensure that free flow of data that we also at the same time uh, are, are aiming to. So with next, with that, I will give a floor to my Latvian colleague here from Riga, Mr. Aris Zervans, who is uh, Deputy State Secretary on Information and Communication Technology from our Ministry of Environmental Protection and Regional Development. Um, Aris, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and uh, I guess this is no, no, no big place for debate. The data is a core element of uh, modern economy. And it's, it's, really, it's really important for us to consider all the aspects of data and data, data circulation in the economy as such. Uh, and uh, till, till now, uh, we quite often have been uh, rather careless regarding uh, uh, data we have, uh, both at personal level when we are clicking accept without reading, as well as at country level or at European level as such. Uh, so to balance this, we really need to have this serious discussion uh, uh, regarding the aspects uh, and need to have a strong considerations about data sovereignty on all levels. Uh, and uh, we need to have uh, some kind of uh, framework or regulatory framework in place uh, regarding how we uh, or how an organization collects, stores and processes the data. Uh, leveraging all the good practices we have uh, uh, around surrounding the topic. Uh, so uh, we, we should be looking for uh, data sovereignty in a pan-European context. Uh, so this framework uh, need to be uh, enclosing all the European data spaces we have. Uh, at the moment here in Europe, it is a really a question of utmost importance uh, to safeguard interests of our citizens and the ownership of their data. Uh, providing data processes uh, according to European values. And we need to create uh, our own capabilities as an um, advantage of the EU competitiveness uh, while being uh, opened uh, to our partners uh, that share the same European values, yeah, to have the same uh, guiding principles around those uh, topics. Yeah. So data and digital sovereignty uh, needs to be addressed jointly uh, with the development of uh, infrastructure components such as European cloud computing capabilities, uh, allowing data storage and processing uh, to be uh, safely done within Europe. Uh, and at the same, at the same time, uh, there should be no limitations or no limits of possibility of transmitting the data to the third countries uh, following the rules that are equivalent to those that we are having here in EU uh, in uh, national level, on EU level, uh, such as uh, GDPR, such as uh, Network and Infrastructure Security Directive, and others. Thank you. Excellent points. I, I already mentioned, I think, uh, uh, what stood out to my, my ears, <laughs> so to say, uh, good practices, probably. Um, I think uh, you, I, I mentioned in others, uh, data spaces, that is something that maybe can create as a facilitator and, and motivator. And then clearly European values, I think we've seen a lot already with GDPR practice to be sort of a global, of a global value. 
And uh, let's see uh, in a discussion when once we continue how we see that really in practice more for data actually uh, still not being a barrier, but actually driving European competitiveness yet remaining open. So uh, with that, I will give, I think, Casper, you are briefly already mentioned as a subject, but I would be glad to hear hear your uh, your opinion. And like, like you mentioned, you are uh, you are now in a company that has a, a big data capacity and, and potential to, to work on it and process it. And then obviously you work in Europe and in the US and ac across the globe. So uh, we would be very happy to hear your perspective. And also, uh, let's see, to keep our Baltic focus, Baltic Nordic focus in mind, what good and what benefit we can uh, get out from addressing this complicated topic. Sure, no, thank, thanks very much, Liva. Um, it'll come as a shocking surprise that I agree completely with the two previous speakers in saying that, uh, you know, the economy of, uh, of the 21st century is very much going to be a data-driven economy. And the sooner we realize that, I think the more opportunities we will have, whether we live and work in a in a smaller European member state or in fact in, in a bigger member state. So I think that's the starting point. And and one of the previous speakers, and I think uh, Liva, you also mentioned it yourself, the, the Data Governance Act. So one of the pieces of regulation coming out of Brussels uh, these, uh, these months. I think what is fantastic about the Data Governance Act is that it actually is not a, let me put it, a cautious, a nervous or concerned approach to data. It actually puts forward the argument which Again, I think it's the right one that there is an enormous untapped potential uh, for Europe to uh, really embrace a data-driven uh, economy. And I, I think that's the right starting point because, you know, technology runs on trust. And unfortunately, what we've seen in the last couple of years is that trust is very easy to erode. And data is, of course, the first place where people lose confidence in, uh, in platforms or new technologies when they see data leaks or data being misused by, uh, by actors uh, around. I think what the Data Governance Act is, is also doing right, but perhaps where we need some additional work is to make sure that we put data into different boxes. Uh, some boxes uh, need to be very secure. It contains very sensitive information. Um, you know, you, you don't want the blueprint of your national intelligence services to float uh, around easy accessible. I think uh, health data for us individuals there are a number of these different data sets that need to be protected uh, uh, in, in a different way than other data sets it would be. But that's a small group um, because I think one of the one of the problems, if, if you want me to be a little bit polemic, and I think we need some Baltic leadership, is, for example, around the discussion on industrial data in Europe. Um, and I'm, I'm going to perhaps uh, overstep my, my role and <laughs> my boundaries here by saying, that I think that very often in Europe is a discussion misunderstood. I very often hear the the, the argument that that industrial data is where Europe is going to, you know, outpace everybody else. We have higher quality industrial data in Europe, and I think that's right. But European industrial data is not European data. European industrial data is global industrial data, and I'm pretty sure that if you are a company operating out of the Baltic countries, or even if you are a big German. Uh, automotive manufacturer, if you are a Danish wind turbine producer, the data sets that you uh, generate and that you can monetize, that you can utilize, those are not data sets that comes from within Europe. Those are data, data sets that comes from around the world. So I think where we really want to make sure that Europe takes the right way forward is to avoid us turning inwards, raising new walls, raising new limitations on the exchange of data, because I don't think that this will benefit the, the European economy or uh, European um, you know, startups, European entrepreneurs. And I don't think it will benefit governments either. And again, I think the leadership we're seeing in the Baltic uh, countries on e-government, on, on really utilizing digitalization to bring forward not only efficiencies, but actually new opportunities, new quality in how we do governance or how we, how we run businesses. That is something that we should learn from uh, across, uh, across Europe. And let me just finish up, Oliver, I promise to do it quickly, by saying that I think there's a misconception. We're discussing a lot of uh, data transfer, and I, 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 I use the word streams too uh, quite a lot uh, every day, and I'm sure that that applies for, for all of you. I think there is a misconception that streams too primarily has an impact on U.S. Uh, companies and their ability to transfer data. And uh, a recent survey in Digital Europe showed that actually 90% 
of European companies are completely dependent on streams too and completely dependent on data transfer. So I think in my view, this is one of the areas where we want to make sure that, that Europe takes the right way forward and where we as a company have to make sure that we provide state-of-the-art technology to make sure that sensitive data is protected without access, uh, cannot be cannot be, uh, be used by, by anybody else. And therefore, I also think, and this will be my last point, that you cannot have digital sovereignty without cybersecurity. And I think I'm speaking to an audience who very much understands the threat, including where some of the threats are coming from. And I think it is a fundamental part of what we do in making sure that we have the best possible defense systems in place to make sure that we, we give protection to governments, to our critical infrastructure, but also to customers and to, to citizens. We need security to be sovereign. And I think that's an important part of the discussion as well. Excellent point. Thank you, Casper. And I think it uh, it links ties back to some of other your colleagues, like actually being in control of your data, but uh, not actually localizing, but ensuring that the flow is there. And I think you rightly mentioned. I think it it is essential for Baltic states uh, when we think of business environment. All uh, businesses are thinking global. You know, nobody nobody only sort of dreams of be it a unicorn or startup or you know any traditional business to expand, everybody obviously speaks as market, as a global market. So that requires quite a bit of data uh, freedom to be able to develop the products and actually innovate and adjust. Um, so I think a lot already have been said. I'm really glad now to turn uh, to turn uh, the microphone or give a floor to Estonian colleague Mart Maggi, who is actually the boss of the data in Estonia, <laughs> if one can say. He is a director general of uh, statistics in Estonia, and then we know very well of, of all, all Estonian global experiences. So. Uh, looking forward to hear some of your perspectives uh, of uh, how do we address this sovereignty issue and, and uh, how do we put it into European perspective and actually uh, remain open instead of uh, locking ourselves down maybe in some stereotype-led uh, uh, thinking. Yes, thank you, Eva. <laughs> and, and, and I really, I think it, why I'm the last one in, uh, in giving my kind of opening um, speech is uh, because I think I, I, I'm not agreeing with all the, the, the statements which has made so far. And, and saying very simply, I mean, if you think about the state sovereignty, uh, we cannot control our uh, citizens. I mean, what we can do is, is really we can, of course, uh, support, we can protect them, we can regulate how the, the nation is, is uh, really uh, handling the things, but we cannot control them. So that's the, the key point. And if you think uh, what is the, the real definition of the data sovereignty is it's, it's come from the idea that the data are subject to the laws and also subject to the governance of the, of the data within the nation where it's collected. And saying this one, the, the word governance is something what we need to really open up and saying this one, uh, if you recall from the past, there was a, a Tallinn declaration in 2017, and that was extraordinary declaration because that was particularly about data governance in EU. It was ahead of the time in this particular time because it's, it's really opened all the different topics like interoperability of data, the trustworthiness of data, security, the openness, transparency. It's all defined by this declaration on this time. So now we are seeing the second wave. And why I'm saying second wave, we see the serenity as a political term, which is used by quite a many nations currently. And I am not a political guy. I am not taking a political view on this one. So what I want to is that what we need in, in Europe is discuss how we govern the data. And the Data Act now, which is coming out, or the data regulations, it's more how, how we governing the data. And let me a bit explore further what is the data governance means. It's, it's really how we can find the data. And that's very hard because as also the, the Minister Sut was mentioning, we use different semantic models across Europe. And that's a problem. We cannot find, and we can even find data sometimes within the nation where it lies. 
So we need to get a, a more cooperation, closer cooperation to harmonizing semantic layers in, a, in, a, in really having the good interoperability of data. We need also to work on with the interoperability, like mentioned as well. So how the data can flow easily within Europe, not saying outside to Europe yet. Uh, we need work also closely in terms of improving the data quality, because that's also very essential. And saying, I mean, of course, yeah, there's like a statistics. I know what the data quality means and how important it is. So we need to work on it across Europe. Uh, it's, it's not an easy task uh, because we need to also define what the, the data quality and consistency means. But that's very, very important before we can go further. So saying this one, there are key elements in terms of really governing the data before securing and controlling. I'm not saying that the governance itself does not include any privacy or, uh, or security, vice versa. I fully agree with the, the previous statements. It does include, it includes privacy, it includes also confidentiality of the data. So sometimes we are forgetting, we are too focused on a privately held or private person's data, but we are kind of forgetting the also the, the legal entity's data, and that needs also protection. Um, the third point I want to make is also that uh, if we talk about the governing the data, which is really collected or which is appearing in, in a nation or in a country, it's really also important that we will get the access to this data. And now I'm pushing Microsoft also, for example. We now, as a statistical office, is now are in a kind of agreement already with, for example, Airbnb, getting the Airbnb data for the statistical and scientific purposes. But that's something what we need to talk across Europe, also inside, but also Europe as well with the MNEs. What is the data which is really publicly needed and for what purposes it needed so that the nations can take a benefit out of it. So that's very important because there is many different areas where we see that getting access to privately held data is really supporting also the right decision making within a nation and within a Europe. So that's my, I would say, bit uh, framing my, <laughs> my viewpoint here in, a, in the very beginning. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, I will also introduce for a quick comments, uh, sort of my co-moderator from uh, Latvia, and uh, she's uh, from the lawyer's office. And, um, you know, it's always good to have a lawyer <laughs> speaking of data and privacy. And uh, I will give a quick uh, floor to Anna uh, Vladimir Kryukova, uh, who is lawyer and certified data protection specialist at Cobalt in Latvia. And maybe you can reflect a little bit from this uh, regulation perspective that is uh, coming up and actually the re regulatory framework, whether that will be something to help us, whether that's maybe the path how we build that trust that we also quite often mention for data sharing and data flow. So a few, uh, few thoughts from your, your side and then we will be kicking off a bit of discussion among ourselves and looking also forward for questions from the audience. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, uh, letting me uh, uh, provide my comment. And um, uh, as a lawyer, I, um, I admire regulations and laws. And uh, I think that actually the current state of regulation, GDPR and other acts that are coming out, uh, well, I guess quite soon, such as Digital Markets Act, Digital Services Act, Act and other acts actually provide a good opportunity for the EU and for Baltics as well to uh, uh, ensure their uh, data sovereignty, sovereignty because, well, the uh, text of this act actually stresses that uh, the data is protected and controlled uh, uh, by the state, by the territory where uh, the nationals, their residents uh, that are related to this data are uh, situated. So. Uh, there is, of course, a legal, uh, a, a, a legal framework that gives the power to states to really control this data and to uh, um, make sure how to treat the data. 
uh, uh, simultaneously, uh, as I see it, and as it has already mentioned by uh, Casper, uh, in terms of, for, for example, Shams' decision, then there is always some kind of uh, political, uh, economical uh, uh, relations aspect that uh, is very important and um, uh, that is a boundary uh, towards the free flow of data and ensuring a real data sovereignty, in fact. Um, this can also be seen from the recent decision of <clears throat> European Court, Court of Justice of Google that actually mentioned that uh, you can control uh, the data in Google only when uh, in terms of uh, data that is processed by uh, European Google pages and not, not other countries Google pages. So uh, there is always some kind of uh, political uh, aspects uh, uh, related to power that uh, clashes with law. Another aspect uh, uh, also more legal that I see that uh, clash of interest between uh, of interests of uh, companies uh, states and individuals, because, for example, uh, the GDPR and uh, the already mentioned acts, they protect the rights and interests of indiv individuals. And it's assumed that they have some kind of priority over their data. Uh, however, uh, what we're speaking uh, now is uh, about is uh, letting uh, companies, letting countries uh, have uh, benefit uh, in terms of data and to use it and to make benefit of it and to create new products, new opportunities. And it uh, makes us uh, uh, understand found a way how to find this consensus between businesses, uh, countries and interests of individuals, uh, because the list actually uh, can really have, can really be sometimes very aggressive in terms of their uh, control over their data. And um, uh, this is always a question and uh, I think that uh, it's going to be clear with the court practice and uh, with the next upcoming regulations such as digital, <clears throat> uh, uh, not digital services act, but uh, data governance act that uh, uh, seeks for a solution to find this compromise between interests of individuals and interests of uh, states and uh, businesses to use the data and to open the data. Thank you very much, Anna. With this, uh, let's see if we can discuss a little bit of some aspects. Uh, I probably will throw a, a sort of a question or, or angle. I'm, I'm looking for maybe more, more uh, your comments. I think we can uh, stick the conventional way, raise hand, and I'll try to sort of identify who of you would, would like to pick an answer. Uh, maybe not all of us for sake of type, we can respond to all questions, but let's try to keep a live debate and see if we also get some questions from the audience. So for me, I got uh, the feeling that n we all understand the sovereignty not as a barrier, but rather sort of a, a good governance. I mean, control is already kind of very uh, hard uh, word, but the good governance, you know, where when one takes uh, care of uh, privacy, where one takes care of confidentiality and security, uh, nevertheless, we all sort of friendly keep a data flow. I think a good point was also mentioned that it's not only about whether European data flows somewhere else, but whether we can access other data. And it's clearly there is a lot of data not in Europe. And I think that's one of the weaknesses that Europeans currently are having. It's actually to stimulate that this data driven uh, competitiveness uh, actually can can take place in, in, in Europe. So we all kind of are on the same it felt we are on the same ground that sovereignty shouldn't be something that should impede that process. Um, uh, I was wondering whether I can pick up some more specific ideas, how you see to incentivize actually this data flow and exchange respecting that sovereignty, whether that can be some, you know, European documents speak about spaces. Uh, there have been ideas of hubs. Uh, can it be something regional? Uh, can it be some other, like maybe some ideas uh, that can incentivize uh, uh, which so uh, something that actually feels maybe uh, quite sovereign right now because all these data are somewhere and not actually interoperable. So anything that you would feel uh, would overcome this uh, sovereignty as an obstacle, but rather actually support that good governance, but create a, a real incentive uh, or uh, a good practice or whatever somebody feels can can share for more concrete. Mart, you, I see your hand. Yes, thank you. I think we have been 
briefly uh, pointed that yes, we have the, the good regulations, but the one important regulation is really open di uh, data directive as well. And, and saying this one, it's it's two parts. One, I mean, first of all, I think we need to go further in terms of the the open data, uh, really getting the the access to the so-called high value data sets. Of course, once again, uh, defining what is a high value data set. That's one part, and that. The second part is including, it's not in an open data directive, but the question is, what is a so-called high value data sets in a privately held data? Which, for my understanding, could be very nice if that could be incorporated to the open data. So it's, of course, always question, could we, I mean, set uh, uh, boundaries or, or regulations that some of the privately held data is open data? But once again, what we see, some parts of it is, of course, high value data sets, particularly if we want to get, uh, for example, green economy growing, or we want to really protect our citizens. So that is the data which really support those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, hello. Um, so I, I would think that a really important aspect also here is transparency, that the, the data flows should be transparent. And uh, regardless of the data location, the ownership of the data should be clear. And the data ownership should stay with the subject of the data. Yeah, and it's here that the really transparency is a key aspect that I am can, as a person, can donate my data to somebody else, but still those are my data, and I'm still on control of those data. Yeah, so this ownership aspect and transparency aspects are really, really critical here. Aris, if I can push you a little bit on this, when you say I'm in control of that data, that means I can pull it back, or you mean I'm in control oh. of, you know, that it's uh, used properly, or you also see that the uh, I mean, whoever According owns, to GDPR, I can ask the data to be returned or basically to be deleted. Yeah, I'm in the control of those data spaces. Yeah, so this is uh, really something which is not not so transparent as I would wish. Yeah, and this is this uh, really important thing that is uh, kind of subject of the data control uh, combined with transparency. And uniform of standards, I, I, as Mart mentioned, is really critical also here, so that we are talking same language. Agla, I also saw your hand. Uh, was it something or Aris already took care of yours? I, I think Aris has uh, already took care of it. Um, anything that you see that has been done on a, maybe as a good practice on a regional level, and I know that Microsoft has actually been, uh, we have one particular pro. Uh, project or idea here in Latvia in a children health sector, uh, I think in together. Uh, but is there anything regional that we can mention as a good practice uh, that also sort of helps to build this trust that there is sovereignty, but that there is also flow of data and that there is actually we see the result. Anyone who wishes to share some some good practice? Mart? Yes, please. Just, uh, just uh, coming to the COVID-19, which is particularly important nowadays. So what we we can share, and I, I really wanted to uh, also uh, give my greetings to all the mobile operators in Estonia, the the Elisa Tele2 uh, Telia. So we have made all together, without any legal force, a mobility analysis and giving it up to the citizens to see what is the current situation. Are we Kind of following the the lockdown rules or not, so that's something what I see. It's, it's really it's beneficial for the society, and once again, it was voluntary based, so that the, it was open dialogue between the mobile operators and the state, and we come to the solution on it. So it's it's really I, I appreciate the cooperation such kind. Anyone else on good practice so that we can uh, contextualize in the regional? I I know that. I'm pushing you because the Europe sees those hubs and I was wondering whether we have ambition and whether we can overcome this sovereignty obstacle or actually perception of it. Diva, can I can I add a few things here? Yes, please. Um, I think a, a couple of points. I think we're seeing at the European level a lot of interesting um, pilot projects, if you like, uh, you know, the data spaces that you referred to, I think are important 
test cases of how we use data uh, to solve issues all the way from healthcare to you know environmental or sustainability issues. But I actually wanted to go back to what Matt said ar around uh, COVID-19, because in many ways that has been the ultimate pilot project around uh, data sharing. And, and I think I can say with, with complete confidence that we would not have been um, able to cope with the last 14 months in the way we have, had it not been because we've been using data at a much higher scale than we've had before. And that goes from everything, um, and, and we have, of course, been, been involved in providing the technology for that, but it, it, it's everything from providing first-line responders at the hospitals with tools to make sure that they prioritize patients coming in, to providing researchers and scientists with easy access to vast amount of data to make sure that the vaccine developments took place at a higher speed than, than ever before. Um, but it's also, I think, uh, something we need to look at when we look at, at the recovery um, challenge we have ahead of us, when we have to rebuild our society and we have to make sure that the millions of people who lost their jobs in COVID-19, that they find a future ahead of them. And I actually wanted to just touch base on, on something perhaps a little less data driven, but, but I think equally important for, for the discussion we're having, and that is the skilling aspect of the digital economy, because, you know, Mart was trying to to stab me ever so gently uh, before on, on the necessity of making sure that we provide information. And Mart, well, if we we're not doing what we need to do, let's have a chat about that. I'll make sure that we do that. Thanks. But but I, I do think that that one of the the challenges around the sovereignty discussion or the data residence this residency discussion is actually perhaps lack of knowledge about how the systems are working, the transparency aspect that you mentioned before. How how are data flows operating today? And I would say two things. I think we need to make sure we develop the skill sets for everybody to make sure that we have an informed discussion, that we take the right decision on, on, on the basis of facts. I think the skilling uh, aspect, and I know that in the Baltic state, you've taken some important steps uh, last year in that direction. We have done that as a company as well, with a big announcement around uh, training 25 million uh, people around the world with new digital skills. I think that's going to be essential as we try and, and recover our economies. Um, but at the same time, um, what, what I would say is that I think it is also important, you know, looking across across Europe, that we really focus on, continue to focus on making sure the data is available. And I just wanted to give you one small example, and I'm so, super sorry that I'm using the car industry uh, again, but the data collected by, by the car industry can be used for many things. Uh, prevent and maintenance is, of course, the obvious one. But if you live in, in the rural parts of, of Estonia, and I don't, so this is probably a very stupid example, but forgive me if I'm saying something inappropriate, and you have data coming back from, from cars showing that you have potholes or problems with particular roads or areas that are particularly prone for, for accidents, that data set is not only relevant for the manufacturer of the car that you're driving in, that data set is relevant for you know the Estonian government that can you know, hopefully use resources in a much more efficient way. And I think what, what the challenge we have as a company is to make sure that we can help diversify those data sets, both between data sets that are sensitive, that needs to be protected, data sets that are the ownership, the IP of the companies that are generating the data sets, and then data sets that are, let's call it, of societal importance that can be utilized more broadly. And I think that is one of the challenges that we're standing in front of. And I think that's a mutual responsibility between the public sector and the private sector. Great. This is a very good, I think, great to have a, a concrete experience. We do have some experience on countryside in Estonia. <laughs> uh, but but no, I'll give no a give floor to Eglin and I'll give a floor to Mart. Uh, I also just, I'm, I want to make one connection from the question uh, from the audience, uh, which actually asks about society and civil society and the role of the society. And I think it nicely brings, Casper, uh, you already brought in this, uh, this feeling that society feels what that data serves for and then maybe that the question was also asked uh, whether that sector civil society as itself can actually help to advance this this uh, this data sharing and also the question of sovereignty so uh, i know egla and marty you had already some comments so maybe you can incorporate also this aspect a little bit thank you 
certainly, I, I can only add to what Casper has said here. And uh, speaking of the potential, there is certainly a huge potential for uh, creating new data spaces or data hubs in strategic sectors, for example, energy, public administration, health and mobility. And um, of course, the potential is twofold. Uh, on uh, This is reacting to the question as well. On one hand, there is a high risk due to sensitive sectors and due to security of citizens data uh, whereas on the other hand uh, opening up options uh, such as um, eu health data space uh, would would certainly uh, reduce uh, information asymmetries between between the eu member states and uh, and uh, also help manage the challenges posed by the, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic quickly. So that would be my short intervention. Thank you, Matt. We don't hear you, microphone. Uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so my, first of all, just uh, coming from the good examples, uh, Mark, uh, I apologize. I think you turn off camera, so maybe if you can turn that back on, then we can see you as well. Do you see Excellent. me now? Yeah. We see you and yeah, hear you. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I mean, uh, saying a couple of words. What are the good examples? And and taking this to this uh, particular debate, um, the good example is also uh, a regional one is that we are currently um, having a, a kind of a, a pilots uh, about the electricity scanner data together with the Sweden, Denmark, uh, Norway and Finland. So it's, uh, it's, it's also a part of the, the data hub, so called. So once again, uh, saying this one, that is, for my understanding, uh, uh, five major uh, uh, data hubs, which is really important. The first one is a geospatial data, and we have the Inspire Directive across Europe. So how we really take care of the geospatial data. There is a electricity data, there is a mobile data, banking data, and the health data. So those five, and, and saying those ones, and now now coming to the to the question from the audience as well. So it's those is datas are are so sensitive. So what we need, and and I think Arias, Arias was mentioning, we need, of course, a more open discussion and dialogue about the values and ethics, how we are using data. And that's not only within a nation itself or in a, in a country, but it's it's more kind of uh, on a European level. So we have the, the regulative laws, but once again, it, it does not always consist how and for, for what purposes the data hubs are used. Uh, so, uh, so therefore, I'm saying I think it's it's there should be a much more open dialogue, and we are now I, I will say in a beginning, and that's this conference is extraordinary example of it. So we need to really keep up and discussing those ones. So for what purposes we need this kind of access and how we take care of the data governance in this field. Excellent points and I think that's where also actually as we used to say in a very different other subjects that Baltic cooperation or Nordic Baltic or regional cooperation for that matter regardless where it is is something that sort of from smaller experience because we need that free data flow not only globally you know we also need it actually in Europe we need to dismantle those internal borders and make sure that we we sharing that data and we can have this analysis but of course we need the same thing globally. So I think a regional approach, we actually been always pushing that, that we can be of an example. And I think it also starts with, with a good discussion and good uh, good involvement also society to see the use in, in particular, for example, in regional context. So I saw Aris and I saw Anna's hand. I also saw still a question, there are a couple more questions coming from audience, but I would like to, uh, if any of you, uh, can reinforce the privacy matters because uh, the the, the uh, audience has mentioned that with the tools of AI that it's like to ensure complete privacy 
it it doesn't look that that's uh, that's uh, possible with uh, with technology means sort of being more and more elaborate so you can be de identified backwards and actually eventually found so privacy is clearly a concern and the trust that we need in society is something I, I guess a challenge we all have to address so I'm giving floor to Ar Aris and sorry for sort of adding on <laughs> angles that have been asked from audience but let's see if we can try to cover and then to Anna please yeah so uh, looking from the benefits of society or to the society and uh, uh, data is not really valuable as such data is valuable in context and uh, those contexts are many yeah, as well as many are those data spaces but what's important is that we are leveraging the data to uh, provide things like uh, public services uh, we are making those public services available cross-border. Yeah, so we have this dimension that uh, we are able to provide some services as a, as a country to citizens of other European Union countries. Uh, we have those networks uh, happening now or producing now uh, in, in uh, various aspects, starting from e-invoices, ending up with health records, traveling both in, uh, in um, European directions and in many directions. Uh, as a such as, as a good example, we have uh, created the infrastructure capabilities to exchange data between Latvia and Estonia as a part of our network uh, of data exchanges, which, which we will have internally in Latvia and Road in Estonia. Uh, so we have those technical capabilities. But the, the main important topic here is that we are leveraging those capabilities to enable services to citizens. And uh, there are a lot of uh, happenings or the data science uh, is maturing. Uh, the capabilities of artificial intelligence is maturing. Uh, we have more and more open data available. And he, this is from one side, it's very good because we are able to provide higher quality of services. We are able to provide predictive services based on some happenings in a person's life. Uh, from another side, to stay anonymous in this environment is very, very difficult. Yeah, and, and to, to find the border where the open data and uh, privacy or GDPR regulations meet now as nowadays is really, really hard. Yeah, and uh, there we need to work both on education, work uh, of uh, the public sector as well as people, uh, and we need to look more carefully on the regulatory framework how we are able to keep GDPR compliancy in artificial intelligence based predictive public services environment. Aris, thank you. I know that we are reaching and um, close to the uh, end of the panel, so I will give a floor to Anna and then maybe a quick uh, sort of a, a few sentence comments that you want to sort of uh, you want the audience take away from from this debate, because I still see from questions and comments that this perception that sovereignty is something to locking data, uh, keeping, uh, controlling it, and that sharing and privacy respecting is, is extremely difficult to grasp. And I think we need civil society, we need education, yet uh, if we add the challenge of social platform and fitting a message into a tweet, it, it is also <laughs> quite a, a difficult uh, challenge and maybe, you know, uh, learning by doing and actually getting people on board by seeing a benefit is also one very concrete regional perspective. So I give a floor with that. I'll give, I will stop here. I'll give a floor to Anna and anyone who feels um, I will give a, a round uh, for a sentence or two to, to wrap up with a key takeaway from here. Uh, thank you very much. I have a, a brief comment that would cover maybe some um, idea on what kind of potential solutions could be to uh, help uh, uh, erase the trust. Um, um, of course, that like uh, people became more aware about their privacy. Uh, I guess they were really less aware about their rights uh, before the GDPR. Now with the GDPR, uh, many people are much more aware about what they can do with their data and how they can limit the usage of their data. This is some kind of like negative side effect of uh, of the GDPR for uh, uh, open data. Uh, and uh, there have been uh, uh, some uh, NGOs, organizations have been uh, uh, thinking about creating different solutions for that. And one of the solutions that I heard about uh, is data are data operators, so-called intermediaries that intermediaries 
that can uh, help manage individuals' their data and the usage of their data by different uh, companies, businesses, uh, states, etc. So it's like your personal data manager um, uh, that helps you control uh, to control your data. Uh, and um, uh, this could be a solution that uh, some kind of this personal intermediary can be uh, a better trusted uh, agency uh, agent in terms of managing the data of persons. Of course, this is an additional chain uh, 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 element of this chain that actually also needs to gain the trust. But uh, as soon as I've heard about this idea, this showed that actually uh, uh, this is a kind of welcome idea uh, amongst uh, uh, still privacy, um, not professionals, but advocates. So, uh, and about AI and privacy, uh, this is a huge challenge uh, because uh, as have been mentioned, uh, uh, AI can collect different pieces of data that are not uh, personal data and put them together and identify any person and uh, uh, get many, informa many information from that. So um, I guess this is uh, our responsibility also to uh, engage different, uh, uh, different actors into, uh, into uh, this AI project, so lawyers, ethics specialists, uh, not only technical people, but politicians and other uh, important actors. So thank you. Anna, thank you. I know that the, the, the organizers are reminding me we are close to the end. So I will ask very quickly, Egle, if you would like to sort of uh, re-emphasize the, the essence and so that, that the sovereignty doesn't become an obstacle, I guess that's what we all hear from here that the audience would take. And, and then I'll give also maybe a, a few words to Kasper and Mart and, and with that we wrap up. Thank you. Um, uh, data is uh, certainly uh, uh, the new oil or the new gold of the 21st century and the world is currently definitely facing a, a data rush. But um, once the data is collected, questions such as privacy related questions such as where is this data stored, who can access it, can it be used in any harmful way and uh, many more questions like this uh, start up. Um, this is the point w uh, at which data protection and data privacy come in. Uh, I, so, uh, concluding, I just want to re-emphasize the point that was made by Aris previously, that if we are willing to have open data available in real time, standardized and adapted to use, we have to pay more attention to education on improving data, li data literacy among uh, different people, especially public se sector em employees. And um, because data literacy in general is not just important to open data, but also how to protect it and ensure that the privacy is protected as well. Great, excellent. I actually think Kasper already also mentioned in between the skilling part. So Kasper, any, any final thoughts and uh, Mart? I'll, I'll do a, a 30 second version of this. Thanks a lot, Lila. Um, we haven't spoken a lot about the uh, Gaia X as a project in, in Europe. And um, if we had another half hour, we could have done that. I think the interoperability of creating a cloud federated, uh, a federated cloud solution in Europe is fantastic. I think it's very much what Mark uh, alluded to earlier to have choices, customers, government can choose between different providers. I think what we have to avoid with Gaia X, of course, that this becomes a party for, for only European companies, because I think there is a price to pay if that happens. And I'm speaking also as a European here, there will be a premium if you do not have access to global competitive technology. And as a European, as somebody who's deeply concerned about, uh, let's say the global geopolitics of, of, of digitalization, I think we have to make sure that Europe will, will stay ahead of the curve, be competitive, take full advantage of the digital economy. So my final remark will be, we need a bigger Baltic voice also inside the European Union. And as I said in the beginning, that is very difficult for me to say as a Dane, but unfortunately it's true. So help us out here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can extend that with the Baltic Nordic, uh, certainly uh, regional voice. And uh, Mart? Yes, my uh, concluding remarks. I, I, you know, Estonians like a lot of principles. <laughs> and uh, that's something we are really uh, taking abroad, so exporting the principles. And, and the one principle definitely which is underlies our, our discussion is, is privacy by design. That's one principle. And the second principle, Coming, by the way, from the, the third principle, once only principle, 
that is also a new principle in Estonia, which is we call twice used. And twice used means that really we don't we need not to forget that the, the, the data can be beneficial for the citizens and the society. So we, we need to take this advantage and have a open discussions for what data is needed. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all panelists. I clearly helped me slightly demystify this topic of sovereignty, which somehow I think has gained this um, stereotype that this is about protection and locking down and keeping all to yourself. I think we try to demystify. I think I've, I learned it more that it's more about good governance, good transparency, being educated and feeling this benefit of data that we actually do uh, have from from data capacity for society and on indi individual level. So thanks a lot, my dear panelists. Thanks a lot to organizers. And with that, I give a floor uh, back to, to organizers. Yeah, thank you so much for moderating this uh, hot topic and the discussion. And uh, what I take away from uh, this discussion is that data is more than like sun. You cannot cover the sun with the hand, you know, you, 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 and you cannot cover the certain. So basically what I hear, we should not become in Europe, uh, North Korea of data, closing the borders and, and uh, being isolated. The benefit of data is reusage. The benefit of data is using it at least twice or getting it only once. What I also hear in, uh, in your panelist discussion, it's really, really important the fusion of the governmental held data and private entities held data. That's how we can uh, create this data economy. And by the way, we also had the pet holes in uh, Lithuania, so I need this car to drive around my village that uh, the government would start repairing these uh, roads, you know. So thank you so much for uh, this discussion and uh, uncovering this topic. And uh, I believe that cooperation will help us even more in uh, in Baltics to become uh, leaders. So I would like to thank also the partners of this conference because without them it would not be possible to to do such a good and quality discussions. And uh, we are coming back to our conference and now there will be two parallel discussions and for ones who are watching the conference in uh, Teams streaming, uh, there will be a link in the chat where you can uh, uh, join the discussion about uh, uh, building European data spaces in GAIA-X and framework and uh, who stays in the teams, uh, they will be hearing a discussion uh, in the first channel, they will be hearing a discussion about data economy. And uh, for the uh, viewers who are watching on Delphi Lithuania, Delphi Estonia, TV Net or LMT Straume in Latvia, uh, you will be hearing these uh, uh, discussions and panel discussions, not parallelly, but sequentially. So you will stay with us and just watch uh, what the discussion is taking place. So now I would like to introduce the moderators of uh, these two panels. Uh, first panel is uh, uh, Data Economy, what we are aiming for, hosted by Mindogas Glodas, president of Infobalt and uh, CEO of NRD Group. Uh, hello, Mindogas. Hello. And the second discussion will be about building the European data spaces and Gaia-X uh, framework. Uh, what's there for Baltics? And it will be hosted by Mr. Luca Silves, Head of Strategy, Innovation and Research Cooperation at Guard Time. Hello, Luca. Good afternoon. So, uh, gentlemen, I'm really happy to see you in our uh, venue. And uh, I would like you to encourage to give uh, difficult topics and difficult questions to the panelists that we would reveal this truth, what, how we can benefit from Gaia-X and what we need to do to become the leaders of data economy in the in, uh, European Union or maybe globally. Uh, let's put the ambition high. <laughs> let's, let's deliver the good results. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mindogas, and uh, 
let's continue with our program. I mean, it's been a great day today. We had uh, we have heard many opinions, but I think uh, overall it's clear that uh, some things are unavoidable. We are living in the age of data. We have a lot of data and now we are just trying to understand how to make the best use of that data. In fact, making the best of use, use of that data to me, coming from the primarily business, means that we also have to learn to monetize that data directly or indirectly by enabling others to make better decisions, to become more efficient. And uh, particularly now, I think with the pandemic situation that we are living through, we all have our own opinion, our own experiences, how those decisions are being made and whether some of those decisions could have been made better if the plethora of data that we have would have been used more efficiently, would have been given to people, more access to people who know what to do with it. So a lot has been said about the GDPR as well. We have to make sure our data is secure, but nevertheless, after we've made it secure, after we have coined the key principles, we have to make as much of it as possible available for uh, uh, the governments, but also the businesses to use them. And we'll be discussing this for during the next people in this area. And let me just very briefly introduce them. So first of all, I would like to introduce Susan Demel. She is joining us from her home in Berlin. And Susan, for quite a few years, has been with the German IT Association Bitcoin. She's gone through many, many roles over those years. And currently, she's the executive, uh, uh, an executive board member of Bitcoin. And it will be very, very interesting to share uh, the experiences and share the perspectives of you know, the large, the really large economy of Europe, but also a very fragmented economy of Europe, which has a lot of federal aspects and uh, and other uh, other things that work slightly different than they do in the Baltics. Going forward. I would like to introduce Elius Civilis. Now, Elius Civilis, apart from being a good friend of mine, he's, he's in, from Lithuania, so we, we worked a lot in the past. He has the experience in uh, uh, the business, uh, working with IT corporations. He's also been a vice minister responsible for all digital matters here in Lithuania. And currently, he's running all digital aspects of Lithuanian railways uh, ecosystem. Going forward, I'd like to introduce Valtz Abos, who's joining us from Riga, I would assume. And Valtz has a vast experience in the healthcare field, which I think these days is extremely relevant to uh, cover this topic: how we can, uh, how data can assist our healthcare officials making uh, the right decisions. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Oliver, Oliver Vartno. Oh, I've never seen so many special letters in the name, so I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. Oh, good. Uh, and again, Oliver has a vast experience that he brings from uh, public sector, but also most uh, lately, he's been working with the Estonian company Cybernetica, which I can easily say is known worldwide for the X-Road uh, uh, introduction in Estonia and lately introduction into a, a vast part of the world, which a lot of, a lot of countries are accepting uh, uh, the same standard and are basing their uh, government, e-government uh, foundations on the X-Road. So, you know, with this panel, I'm sure we can, uh, if not build the digital economy, at least we can discuss where to start and how to continue. 
So with this, I would say in the same sequence, I would like to give you just a few words to set the floor, to set the, uh, you know, the, the perspective that you are coming from, and then we'll continue with uh, diving deeper into those aspects. And also, I hope, involving the audience. And uh, just to remind the audience, those who are joining from through Teams, please use the actively the, the right-hand side of the screen where you can post questions to your uh, to the to the panel speakers. So see, Susan, without further ado, please uh, use some three minutes or so to make the Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really happy to, to um, participate in this debate and give you a little insight on the views that we hold um, um, at Bitcom, Germany's digital association. And I think um, when I look at our association, we already see that we are in the middle of it, of the digital transformation. And that shows that we don't um, only have um, our classic traditional ICT industry members anymore, but we see more and more um, digital companies coming from the insurance sector, from the banking sector, from pharmaceutical industry, from the uh, manufacturing industry and uh, others. And I think um, this is um, the view we hold. We think that um, we have to find our way um, from our traditionally successful industries um, to uh, towards the data economy. So we have to, to transform their business models and their way of doing business into, um, uh, into some data economy um, um, uh, form. So what is this? <laughs> I think um, it has many aspects. Uh, we have... Um, what, what we're aiming for is the successful um, development of new technologies and the use of the of those. So we want to use data to um, to build um, artificial intelligence, to use artificial intelligence to solve the big challenges that that, that we are facing. So um, I think um, there are many aspects here that have to go together. One is the um, for, for Europe, one is the, the framework, the regulatory framework, the political framework that we have to, uh, with which we have to set the scenes and to give the conditions that we can actually work with data. We have we heard a, a few things on that before on the on the on the panel before. Um, and second, we are we are having to uh, uh, we have to find um, new ways of actually doing our business. Um, when, when we look at it, a lot of what we had done in the past was um, selling products and, and, and manufacturing products. And now um, I think we, we really have to, to shift these business models into services and, and um, um, as a serve based business models, which also can be um, a hard process because you suddenly um, make um, maybe a competitor to yourself <laughs> while building these new businesses. Um, uh, so I think we have to work to, together really closely. I think for Europe, the big challenge is that we are still a lot of different national member states with different, um, still not uh, a completed harmonized digital single market. So um, we, I think we'll take some more time to, to actually fulfill that. So for the meantime, we have to work closely together to, to, um, to create these, these common market and this common space where we, where we can do business and where we can let, actually let data flows. And as well as this, we also have to break up the silos between the different sectors in which we have hold data uh, and, and, and find our ways on how to cooperate between and in between these sectors. And there's I think there's a lot of a lot to do there, um, practical hurdles and, and traditional traditions that we have uh, built up. But I can see so many good I ideas coming, especially from the Baltics and and um, as, as Germans, we, we look very closely what happens um, here because um, things seem to to um, progress a little faster there at times. Uh, I mean, we operate under the same European legal framework, but sometimes uh, we, we feel things don't 
um, or we see a lot of problems with the legal uh, frameworks we, we, which don't seem to exist in the Nordics or in the Baltics. So I think we can learn a lot from a more a pragmatic view on that. And so I'm happy to exchange here and, and um, yeah, maybe go into detail a li little later and let yeah. the others go. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Susan, for, for these uh, sort of first words. You know, when I was researching a little bit on Bitcom, and I, I can't remember now from the top of my head, but you have uh, at least, I think, a uh, couple of thousand members. I guess all of these are IT companies or companies that, that have a certain interest in information technology in digital economy in that sense. And this is uniting actually private initiative, which I think when we talk about data economy, extremely important to keep in mind that we have the industry discussion, how the public sector who has so much data, can they make this data available to private companies to make proper use of it? But let's move forward. Elius, I know you also have a lot, a lot of ideas to share, so please go ahead. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, well, firstly, I would like maybe to express my excitement about this uh, conversation and uh, big compliments to you. So oh, not just to make something that cold, uh, an exciting thing. Every time we teamed up with the Baltics, we would always end up into the great successes. I mean, think of the very beginning of the Baltic way on our independence. I mean, it was such an enjoyment, you know, being together with the, with the guys next to you, having same uh, vision. And every time in the newspapers, when I read something that comes, you know, in the cooperation between the countries, I feel this great sense. I mean, I really like when uh, someone, you know, uh, really uh, applaud what happens in, in Estonia or in Latvia or in Lithuania, because uh, whatever is good for Estonia, it's good for the Baltic countries as well, and vice versa. I mean, if it's good a fintech in Lithuania, that's good for the whole uh, Baltic countries. So deep diving into this topic, data economy, I want here to put emotions first. I mean, this is, again, and a fantastic opportunity for these three countries, you know, to do something amazing. Amazing that each of us, we could tell a stories to our, uh, you know, kids uh, on what we have done teaming up together. So I'm really looking forward uh, for this conversation and how can we do that uh, with very practical uh, suggestions, Sam. Thank you, Elius. And uh, yeah, indeed, when you talk these sentimental things, I think uh, we are reliving that. You know, when, when we sort of break, broke away from the occupation by the, the then Soviet Union, I was thinking about Benelux, you know? I, it didn't happen, right? Well, neither Benelux happened, but uh, I think we are back into a new iteration, which is more which has more uh, you know, foundation to be real because by acting together, uh, we can really uh, show leadership. And, and when I uh, remember what Kaspar said earlier today about Danes actually looking with envy that the small countries can, can move so fast and make such a big impact, actually somehow pull the other bigger countries with, uh, with what they do, I think we should be really proud of that. And I think, our size is pretty much also part of the reason for this agility. So we should use it. Absolutely, we should use it. But Valtz, I'd like to turn over to you now because you are really coming from the field, from the industry, which is now, uh, you know, on everybody's mind. We have elevated the, the healthcare profession to to such a high level and such a high respect and, and, and rightfully so, because we've been living through, still living through very difficult times. But uh, I know that you would probably have arguments that should we have some data sooner? Should we have some more people involved in analyzing it? We would have been able to make better decisions. But anyways, please let us know. Okay, thanks Minda, I guess, uh, yeah, really pleased to, to take part in this discussion. Uh, I'm coming from the sector uh, which is uh, 
rapidly becoming the key driver of the data economy. Uh, however, when I was studying medicine, and that was about uh, 25 years ago, there were uh, basically no curricula talking about data analysis, sequencing, omics, or even uh, having the computer class. So it's a major paradigm shift which is happening now, uh, well, uh, in this field. So I, I would like just to well, highlight uh, the case for data economy in healthcare and uh, um, recent developments have changed the way we manage, the way we analyze and utilize data across different industries. But one of the most notable areas was, uh, I think, honestly, with a huge progress, but even bigger potential is a healthcare. And we have seen that during pandemic and, and in many other occasions. So health, health, uh, health professionals, just like many other industries, have uh, multiple, basically every opportunity to collect massive amounts of data and are looking for the best ways how to leverage them. Yeah, and uh, well, I, it was interesting to learn that the health data actually make up to 30% of uh, world's stored data. And uh, you know, a single patient generates nearly 80 megabytes of uh, per year in the imaging or electronic medical records and other means. So huge amount. So uh, and a healthcare is really a vivid example for a definition of data economy, uh, where enormous amount of data are gathered, and if organized and if exchanged properly, may generate significant value from those accumulated information. So the data economy in healthcare um, really to, uh, has a potential to really to, to, to reduce the costs of treatment, to predict outbreaks uh, of epidemics, to uh, uh, avoid uh, preventable diseases, improve quality of life, and many other things. So, but uh, I think the most important to note is that value of data economy in healthcare is special. It's not just about uh, creating uh, revenues or, or innovations or whatever, it's about saving lives. Yeah, and that's the, 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 the biggest uh, biggest gain. So what are the opportunities? We know that there are a lot of unmet medical need. Yeah? And therefore, speeding up the search process would accelerate uh, our uh, like course towards the more advanced solutions. So data-driven healthcare, one, integrated care pathways, two, precision medicine. These are, I, I guess, the if I may say so. And uh, for example, uh, uh, like electronic health record, and that's very rich uh, data which we have in electronic health record, and uh, it covers like many things like medical history, family history, whatever uh, medical procedures, analysis, etc., etc., images, and that offer, offer, offer the opportunity to design the new algorithms, to advance the care pathways, to advance the care itself, etc. Now we talk precision medicine. That represents a, a leading driver currently in the health data economy, in which healthcare uh, uh, recommendations can be individually tailored on the basis of person's genes or, or, or uh, lifestyle or, or environment or any other data. So, for example, our hospital serves as a national center uh, for coordination of rare disease management. So, sharing data is critical for rare diseases both from the learning uh, healthcare system perspective, uh, because we want to optimize the delivery of the care, and precision medicine uh, perspective as well, to be able to effectively personalize the care plan. In fact, to some extent, the sharing and exchange already happening uh, at the EU level through the effective engagement into European uh, reference networks for rare diseases. And this is an initiative supported by European Commission. Another project I would like to mention, so, uh, uh, as part of Latvian Pediatric Cancer Initiative, we run uh, whole gen genome sequencing for every new cancer uh, patient. Uh, so we produce a lot of valuable data. But to uncover full potential of these, we need to be part of data collaboratives. So uh, we have like 60 new uh, cancer patients, 50, 60 new cancer patients per year. That's important that we uh, do the sequencing to any of them 
but it's not enough. So effective networks uh, needs, uh, need to be built and uh, to exchange the data, both for primary, but also for secondary use. So, and, and such exchange will definitely contribute to personalization of treatment for a particular patient, but also will boost the future research and care advancement. And we talk genomics is the fastest growing technology invented so far. Genomics data have grown massively. Costs of this technology is going down. So uh, genomic studies are increasing in the size and scope and last few years has been really the game changer. And we are not even talking or touching other omics which are following now. So to conclude, there is really, really solid case for the data economy in healthcare. So uh, there are obviously also problems, but uh, I believe we we'll talk about the problems later. Yeah? <laughs> Absolutely. No, I think that in principle, when we think about healthcare, we only have, have healthcare because historically, since ages now, we have shared data. You know, some people had to sacrifice their life uh, because there was no treatment, but because we know what happened to them, the treatments have been created. And, and as we progress, I think we will need more and more of that. And you mentioned a couple of initiatives that I believe uh, achieve just that. What is interesting, and we'll discuss that later, health data seems to be the most private data, the data nobody wants to share, and yet it's probably the most shared data. So interesting times we're living in. But Oliver, over to you now. I've already said you have a varied experience, and, and lately you come from this company called Cybernetica, which is so well known in the world now for its uh, some really foundational work. So please, the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mindaugas, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, also, thank you for the organizers of the conference to uh, to speak up and, and share my ideas over here. Thank you, Mindaugas, for the kind words and for the introductions. Um, yes, Cybernetica has um, quite a global footprint. Um, we've been deploying our technologies um, to about 35 countries around the world and mostly um, in the later years, our experience has come from deploying X-Road or X-Road um, similar solutions to, to about a dozen countries. Um, X-Road is a platform that basically uh, enables to link different data sets together in order to provide a one common uh, data space in a country. Mostly it is used for in-country data exchange, meaning that different uh, civil authorities exchange their data, but also in Estonia, it is wider, widely used also uh, by the private sector for exchanging data between themselves or between, um, uh, between governments or governments and their customers or customers and businesses. What we have learned over, over the years is basically that one needs to put the user of the data in the center. Um, when you don't have specific use cases, defined use cases where you create value, usually these kind of data, let's, get, let's say data marketplaces or data, uh, um, data exchange layers, they don't take off. So you always need to have a user in the center. You need to think what does the you what kind of value do you bring to the user with your services? Bear in mind, Estonia has been exchanging data with Finland over the X-Road platform since 2016, or actually Finland adopted X-Road as its uh, uh, data interoperability platform in 2016. And only in the last two years, we have seen the creation of um, cross-border digital services. And, that's, and that is the reason because we haven't had any good use cases for the usage of the data. Um, as, as was uh, mentioned by my minister and also the head of statistics in Estonia, um, the two use cases that the countries currently use is uh, the, uh, the data exchange between two business registries because of um, data needs to be exchanged on business um, who are banned from the business. So. Um, uh, so the two law enforcement know actually that uh, somebody who has who's been banned in Finland to create the business in Estonia doesn't do that in Estonia. And also information in regards to social security data. 
And this is why, because we have a quite a big community of Finns and Estonians that are actually um, operating in both of the countries or living in both of the countries. But when we look, for example, creating digital services between Spain and Estonia, which are hundreds or thousands of miles apart, I suspect that there is much harder to create these kind of services. Second thing that we have learned uh, in regards to uh, cross-border digital service is, is that when we look at different jurisdictions, uh, semantics is a huge problem. The way how data is uh, described in, let's say, United Kingdom of Great Britain um, and Estonia, for example, in the domain of transportation or environment, uh, is completely different to Estonia. And I think that that's a huge um, effort for regulatory bodies. And I'm now sa sad to say that UK has, of course, left European Commission. But I think Europe should put a lot of effort into, um, into semantics of the data. For example, in healthcare, Estonia uses HL7 for its uh, description of, uh, of uh, personal medical record data. In United States, the predominant uh, um, standard is fire standard. And I think there should be a lot of work actually on the political level to be done on that uh, domain. And finally, uh, my last point before we go into discussion, I wanted to talk a little bit about these uh, data marketplaces or these interoperability platforms that, that we create. Um, as we have done in um, work in about 10 countries deploying these um, interoperability or data marketplace platforms, I must say that actually the needs, or the, let's say the customs and the culture needs for interoperability platforms are different. Um, the way one thinks about control of data in the United States is completely different to uh, the control of data in Japan and in Europe. And I think um, we should, at least in, in the European or in the Baltic scale, try to find out what is the most optimum way of building that platform. Estonia, through an X-Road, is an excellent example. I'm sure Finns don't copy it one-on-one. -on -one. I know that the Japanese don't copy it one-on-one. -on -one. You have the issues of data control, privacy, consent management, all these kinds of issues that are super important and that I can open up during the discussion once needed. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, I can actually confirm. We, through my uh, company, we've done a lot of research on, on X-Road, and since we work worldwide, we have spoken to quite a few governments or did some research. I would say there are currently, I think, about 20 more either complete or ongoing implementations of X-Road and many more are actually talking about the principle. So in some ways you could say Estonia has uh, set up a standard that's becoming more and more useful and through that standard I think we will be able to achieve that interoperability. But I think in in practically everybody's uh, interventions that we have had so far we've heard the, the fact that you know you have data, but also you have to know how to use that data. You have things more specifically mentioned that unless you have a very uh, realistic usage scenarios, nobody will be using that data. You will be collecting it, you will be sitting on that asset, but nothing will happen. And this is where I'm sure that uh, private uh, initiatives could be extremely helpful. And I'd like to turn, you know, to, to Susan and Elliot, because I know that you know, Susan, through representing uh, different uh, uh, companies uh, who are obviously involved in these processes, you know how this connect, how this works to convince sometimes the public sector institutions to open up this data. When we talk about open data and, and having the access in a very responsible way, but my argument is those who have data do not necessarily know what to do with it because their task, like Department of Statistics, is to collect the data, 
and then give it to someone who has uh, a, a better scenario for the use of that. And I know Elias introduced that in Lithuania through GovTech Labs. But Susan, first with you, uh, how does that work in Germany? Is the public, uh, public and private sector cooperation in this field working well? Well, I'd, uh, I'd say um, we are on the way <laughs> to improve that. But I think um, when it comes to open data, um, uh, Germany still has to um, to, to go uh, a bit of a way. At least um, I think what we have is um, a general, um, well, the general knowledge that, that we really have to work on this. But there is a couple of uh, practical um problems also for the public sector i think that they have to overcome first of all it's having the data for a certain um purpose that were, they were collected for doesn't mean you have them in a format and in a in a uh, form that that is um um adequate to to publish them or to give them to the public for example second so so you have to put some more effort in in it to actually make them available so that that's a problem when the public sector already um, um struggles getting its normal work done so this this is perceived very often still as an extra work to and and i think we are um, th there is uh, the, the data strategy of the German um, uh, federal government um, that's working on that and that's really um, trying to get a more active um, approach um, um, into this this whole open data uh, process. Um, and I, but but the, the second thing is as, as Germany consists of 16, um, different Bundesländer, so the regions, um, that's another problem because the, they have their own, for example, they have their own data protection laws for public data. So it's not only GDPR, but it's also 16 other um, laws that we deal with, for example, and sometimes the um, people working um, in in um, these public institutions, they, they, they don't want to make any mistakes when publishing or, or, or uh, making available data. So um, I think we need a lot of um, help in this regard to, uh, to help them to actually know what to do and, and, and what makes sense, what is safe, what was secure um, and how can these data be, be used. Thank you, Susan. Elius, I know you've done quite a bit of work while you were a minister with GovTech Lab. That wasn't easy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but honestly, uh, I think, you know, we have this uh, huge dilemma, right? Uh, whether this is a chicken or egg, is it the government or a private initiative comes first? My personal take is that, uh, uh, well, from my personal experience, I mean, the government has a lot of pressure. It has a pressure when it comes to the economical uh, uh, you know, effect from this COVID. Then they have a pressure on the geopolitical uh, uh, instability, right? And then many, many, many other questions. So they just cannot cope, you know, with so many uh, different uh, priorities. So I personally, everything we say here, I wish we have a continuation. This won't end up just in this fantastic panel, but we will do something out of it. So my suggestion would be, uh, and this has already proved to be working very nice uh, on the European level. Once we uh, decided in, back in 2018 that AI is one of the you know, most impacting technologies in the next coming uh, years, and there was a high level expert group that was built not from the politicians, but rather from the business, academia, and they were given a very specific task. So I wish for this conversation, we do not turn to the government and say, hey, why don't you now put aside everything like economy recovery plan and all those structural uh, uh, reforms and then you just focus on data. And they, they will say, yes, that's fine, but this is now priority number 99. So I would like, you know, them to say, hey, guys, if you give us this credit that we come up, you know, with this uh, data economy uh, framework and the suggestions for the policy and investments recommendation, how we can, uh, you know, synchronize those three Baltic countries, just like we did, you know, synchronization with the electricity recently, 
right? Disconnecting from Russia and then connecting to another uh, uh, networks. So we do exactly the same on the high level. We come up with these recommendations and then this would be a moment that we can prove that we're creditable, not just to you know, uh, work on our own interest, but actually for the whole region interest. And out of those recommendations, we can then really help government, you know, to do things. It's just because uh, from my experience, it never works just bottom up. What we do with the uh, GovTech, because the GovTech is about, you know, uh, uh, promoting innovation in every institution by solving their real life problems, right? Uh, and this is another big topic which we have to discuss, that we have to open up those type of uh, initiative across the Baltic countries. Just like, you know, the startups from Estonia can also work on the Lithuanian projects and Lithuanian pro startups also in other countries. So we have to make this market uh, across the Baltic countries. And then we come up, you know, with uh, uh, bottom up initiatives, but also it has to be top down. And the top down, this is somewhere where we have to demonstrate our creditability. And, you know, it's really difficult to comment. I, I listen to Waltz, I listen to Susan, I listen to Oliver. All of those ideas are fantastic. We just have, you know, to bound it somehow and put it on the table, right? I mean, because we have an expertise, we know how to do this. We just need, you know, to have this agreement that the government is giving us, you know, this flag and guys do a favor for us, come back, you know, with the uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, thank you, Alice. In fact, we already have some uh, questions coming from the audience, and I think two of them are somewhat related and, and, and very relevant to the, you know, current moment in our discussion about uh, the, uh, the data and the residency rules and the exchange of that data between the different jurisdictions, and particularly exchange of that data, say, with US-based cloud services. And I think this is, a, this is a very relevant topic because we know we are living in a global economy and we know that US in certain areas has the largest, the most powerful uh, data centers. How should we make sure that we don't end up, as, as the other Mindogas from Infobalt was saying, the North Korea of data, right? completely locked into ourselves, not letting anything out, not letting anything in. And here I'd like to connect also a bit to to Waltz and then uh, to Oliver, because I think in, in, in healthcare, we somehow historically managed to sort that out because uh, uh, we have uh, large multinational companies that do drugs research and obviously they collect very, very private data from different citizens, from different countries, and it's somehow taken care of. Should should we think of a framework for all other sorts of data, how it's dealt with, and obviously what are the consequences if that data is misused? And I think that connects, Oliver, to, you know, to, to the X-Road story and your exchange with, with, with Finland, and since X-Road is now adopted by 20 other countries, and, and I know actually a couple of them in Africa, and in fact in every continent, that's definitely going outside of the EU. Should we make sure that that exchange is possible and secure? Well, but first with you. Well, uh, I would say that I'm not a legal expert, and, uh, and I can say yes. Uh, uh, there, but I mean, there were, obviously, I mean, there, there is a solution for a good initiatives. Yeah, I mean, if there is a case, uh, the solution usually comes. But I would like to revert a little bit uh, uh, to uh, that, 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 the, the, the question of obstacles to more uh, like practical or smaller even things or, or everyday things. Yeah? So dealing with the counterparts from other hospitals, what I see. Uh, I see multiple initiatives across Europe. However, it seems that uh, there is really lack of coordination and scale. So moving forward, we, uh, I think we, we just require more robust, uh, secure uh, and uh, interoperable uh, infrastructure uh, also here, uh, like uh, clear governance frameworks and, and, uh, and, and, and defined services. And that's, that's, I think, it's still not yet done. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, healthcare data are only valuable uh, if by some means they serve the patients. What we currently see, we see that significant uh, fragmentation and working in silos. Yeah? And that prevents, uh, like, I, I think that anything, uh, uh, well, even if we do not touch, 
the data security and, and, and legal aspects. So currently we're talking, for example, I touched about the electronic health records. So these enable, for example, hospital to share clinical data across the hospital or probably exchange with the patients through the patient portals. But on the other hand, what we see, it may create a lack of interoperability with other organizations, even now in the country. Yeah. Looking for an international perspective, in many cases, such valuable data are inaccessible even to patient himself yeah, in other country if he moves somewhere. And most likely, uh, these kind of data are kind of nationally siloed and shielded. So understandably, uh, health data is sensitive, but unlocking this wealth of information, uh, which is based on trust and legal certainty, uh, that, that can have some, um, some important uh, change to, to the healthcare system. Now, what I'm talking about very practically is also like uh, very technical things, like achieving that interoperability uh, among the healthcare systems. So, so we are able to seamlessly exchange information. That's critical. Currently, I think we are not using more than 15 or 20 percent of health data, which uh, which we collect, and because uh, the data remain unstruct uh, unstructured and. Uh, and uh, untapped basic, basically after uh, these are collected. So uh, I think that fundamentally uh, this lack of interoperability directly kind of inhibits the uh, health system from providing uh, the better care to the, uh, to the system. And there's another point. So patient generated data, yeah, data from other sources, uh, not electronic medical records, which we do in the hospital, but all the other data, these should be seamlessly uh, also accessible and uh, uh, uniformly inter interpretable yeah, uh, along the other things. So, and uh, what we talk here, uh, we talk about the different type of data. And I think there will be the huge uh, blurring in what we call the healthcare, what is the fitness and what is not healthcare data. When we talk about the healthcare, we talk usually about the electronic medical records. But what if you have uh, information about the patient genome where he did the test himself, yeah, 23andMe, for example? What if you have information about the OTC drug consumption, physical activity levels, sleep patterns, sick days, all the other data like smartphone wearables, yeah, all the sensors generate something. So all, also researchers can integrate these kind of data to develop uh, and test new innovations. And the potential is really huge here. And um, the question is, how well we're going to deal with that? So one of the single most possible useful things, if we could uh, do possibly agree on some standardization principles, uh, how we do mapping and how we do recording. Uh, for example, serum creatinine, that we know uh, whether, we don't know basically if, uh, if it's the same uh, across the multiple different hospitals. In most hospitals, you don't even know if it's the same in the same hospital. So the problem currently is not that uh, hospital A is doing one thing and hospital B is doing other thing. So I think we are still using the different standards even in one hospital. And there are certain steps which we need to kind of overcome uh, or, or obstacles we need to overcome to, to utilize the data even in a, in a, in a broader networks. So, uh, that's, yes, that's, I think, uh, that's, that's, I think, where I stand. <laughs> yeah, you brought an interesting perspective about you, user, the data that user volunteers to share. In fact, giving a suggestion, use it and give me some insights by comparing it to the others. And I think these wearables is a very good example uh, that's used by uh, a lot of uh, companies uh, that, that do this uh, sports equipment. But I think what is missing in that piece is actually collecting, connecting that to some environmental data that, for example, advising you don't run where there is a pollution at this time of the day or, 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 or things like that. But uh, Oliver, I, I was uh, referring also to, to you at the beginning uh, and the X-Road concept, which often is the foundation for the exchange of data between uh, the institutions within the country. Not often, always it is, I would say, but then often it is uh, the means for the two different countries to connect, exchange data, and eventually even store their data uh, in another country, which uh, again, bringing back as to the original question, mm -hmm. how do you see which should we should be able to resolve this issue of uh, not becoming 
a locked in ecosystem and uh, you know sharing with the others even outside the eu yeah that's a that's a huge discussion and a debate but a couple of couple of remarks um uh, in regards to xroad and then how i see the data sovereignty uh, cloud infrastructure uh, from my perspective so first of all in regards to to the xroad concept um currently only estonia and finland have built uh, this kind of uh, um, cross border digital services and if you look at the way how it's done is that first of all uh, on the prime minister level there was a, a signature or a ceremony to to provide this technical interoperability and uh, uh, by the way this uh, this didn't take any liability that services were going to be built it just said that there is a technical interoperability to, to exchange data between uh, uh, two countries and if they uh, exchange data then this is going to be done over the x road they didn't take the liability to push for individual services um, the the liability for that was was taken or was pushed down to individual agencies authorities to form these bilateral agreements and and basically through in these bilateral agreements stipulate that they have the power of attorney to exchange this data and if you look at the, the 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 current use cases that we have then these are kind of public good uh, use cases where you can say that they are really acting on the behalf of the interest of the of the citizen that is in the other country um there is no universal um guarantee that you know you can exchange data uh, or that you have full liability full um full guarantees to exchange data between across the borders because still i mean the data should stay in estonia and that's what this, this the data was actually um collected for and now we come to come to this issue of uh, of cloud infrastructures microsoft gaia x and 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 what not is evolving in europe so i i see that you know if a country collects my data, it collects this on 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 a legal basis, and it says that uh, this data is going to stay in Estonia. That is currently the the status, I think, in most of the European countries. If they change the law and say that um, the data can reside anywhere else in the world, I think the governments have to take a lot of you know reconsents for for uh, for keeping that data and that is a that is a huge discussion that is happening currently for example if we are using microsoft teams and and exchanging some kind of personal private information let's say two doctors are exchange uh, are using teams uh, one from um, a hospital in riga and the other one let's say in i don't know Cesis, they are exchanging data on a on a patient, and that's a private data. Uh, for example, personal code, the the um, the uh, what has happened to the data, what, uh, or what has happened to the person, how we're going to treat him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The current law actually doesn't give the consent that the doctors can do this because of the fact that the data processing happens outside European Union. It actually the te the data travels today. To United States because this is where the team uh, servers are running. We don't know what's happening with that data, and and it's been pushed back. And that's the huge discussion. What for for example we are having in Estonia. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that okay, if we allow this kind of um, services to take place, um, and we store let's say part of our I don't know uh, national um, let's say citizen registry or or driver's license database somewhere in the in the Google Cloud or AWS Cloud. What does it mean actually to the continue continuation of the services? What happens if we get un, we go under a DDoS attack, um, like we did in two thousand and seven, where most of our um, internet connection with the uh, with the with the world were taken down? 
that means also that how how uh, in 2007 how Estonia actually mitigated that crisis is that we closed off the the world from from uh, from Estonia we closed the the external internet uh, off but we could run our government services inside Estonia if we had AWS or something like that providing these services this would have probably not been the case and we couldn't have run our country um, uh, from from Estonia. So these are very, very fundamental questions um, that need to be addressed. But I fully agree with Kasper's uh, point uh, in the beginning where he said that US has a technological superiority today and you cannot easily replace the services that you get from AWS or Microsoft or any of the US big players. We just don't have the European equivalents. So we have to kind of gradually find that balance and really negotiate. And, and I think that some of these critical infrastructure components have to come to Europe. We have to, we have to be an equal player to, to Microsoft, to Amazon, to Google, to run their services partly in Europe. Mm -hmm. Like, like uh, the U.S. defense contractors do in U.S., if you want to sell your defense technology to to United States, you have to prove that this company is actually under the control of U.S. citizens and it can operate independently. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. I think you are in part already answer the question that has come from the audience uh, raising an issue of the cybersecurity standardization not only for the exchange of data between the institutions but also when data is sitting somewhere being just stored being collected right so there, there should be a common standard that we all understand what may and what may not uh, happen with it and, and you know your example about the cyber attack i think uh, well, that's, um, that's the next uh, type of war that we will see more and more uh, practically uh, on a daily basis. Uh, a very specific question, by the way, that also came from the audience, and I think this we, we, we need to address that because it's about the GDPR and some uh, supposed, uh, supposed inconsistencies. Like the GDPR says the citizen has the right to have his data forgotten by whoever collected it, but sometimes governments have requirements to keep it for 50 years. How to resolve that? Uh, who wants to take this? Uh, I think I know the answer, but I, I'd like you to respond to that. Anyone? Susan? You, you, what what um, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there is um, the, the right to be forgotten is uh, I think it's it's not an an absolute right like um, it, it's it's with all it, sometimes it's forgotten uh, in in our data protection um, discussions that that we, we are talking about fundamental rights but there's all, always different fundamental rights that have to be brought into balance and and into relation and this is for example if you're a, a public figure, then your your right um, to be forgotten is also limited um, because there's also this interest of the public to to um, get uh, get relevant information um, from you. But um, what I do agree with is that we still have a lot of contradictions within for ex national laws and and GDPR and 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 a lot of um supplementary um, legislation as well that we might have to look through to to make things a little easier i think if we could all settle on um, building on the on gdpr as uh, as um as the central um book of rules and and agree on on um, harmonized interpretation of these rules which we are far away from at the moment i think um that would already make things a little easier. Yeah. No, I, I actually fully agree with you. I think we as Europeans should be proud of GDPR and the, the, the way it's constructed and actually so many countries now are looking into that and, and trying to get GDPR compliant. So I think we've done the right thing uh, to make it very strict and yet when you research it, 
a, a lot of the things are still possible, but it sets the playground, the even playground for everybody. Now, look, we've been talking quite a, uh, some time about uh, a lot of general stuff, but I want to become very concrete and ask each one of you, give me an example that's, that's coming first on your mind. What is this, you know, uh, data economy? Give a specific example, if you can think of, what you think would be a good example how this uh, this works. You know, I, I can give you my own example that I think is a perfect uh, example of that. It actually, unfortunately, no longer exists, but it was a very nice attempt. A Lithuanian startup called Place I Live has built a, con uh, uh, a website where you could go and check data from multiple sources, which got analyzed by them, to, to, to advise you on where you would like to, you know, purchase the next uh, property that gave you data on pollution, on uh, uh, security, on crime levels, on availability of different services and so on and so on. Then they had their own ranking system. They collected data from so many multiple sources that if you were trying to do it yourself, you would be spending a very long time. But this was a good example. Obviously, it was a monetized service. You had to pay for it and therefore, somebody built a, a viable business on public data. Can you think of any other examples that pop up first to your mind? Who wants to go first? Oh, surely you that's, must know some examples. <laughs> maybe maybe that, that's not on, on public data, but that's what comes to my mind when I, I spoke about the manufacturing industry, for example. We, we just um, set up with the two um, big other associations um, in, in that field as an, uh, the ind industrial twin association and uh, digital twin association, which um, um, we will have many for many machines. We will just have a digital twin and you can use it um, to um, improve the machine to um, um, for, for man maintenance reasons and, and so it'll save a lot of um, material money. It'll be uh, um, more sustainable than, than current models. And um, I think we are quite far in, um, uh, th there are many use cases on that already. So I think that, that comes to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In fact, you know, it's uh, suddenly we've come to the uh, end of our conversation, but I see Oliver raising hand and absolutely. I'd like to hear from you and also very briefly afterwards from Waltz and, and Elias. Very, very briefly. Yeah, so I have one bad use case. Uh, five years ago, a couple of my friends wanted to um, uh, or created a startup which basically had a vision that you don't buy a car, you don't go to a salon, uh, but you set, set your requirements. You know, I want to have a, you know, I want to drive my car to the forest, you know, go through the terrain, blah, blah, blah. And then they had these indicators. And, and it would provide you, uh, we've, we've analyzed 1,000 cars that are in the production today in the world, and you should buy a, you know, Range Rover Defender or whatever, you know, and they failed miserably. It didn't work. But um, <laughs> that, that comes to your real estate uh, example. But, but I, am, I, I think, well, for me, the healthcare is, is interesting. And, and um, you know, I'm a, I do quite a lot of sports and um, follow my health quite, quite a lot, but they're like little snippets. You know, I have this Aura ring, I have the Garmin clock, you know, I go, may, I haven't done a genome uh, 24 and me analyzes yet, but I think that there is a whole potential to go from these, you know, professional Medicare to, mm. uh, to lifestyle, to, to all bind it into a one personalized uh, um, healthcare or medicine offering for the individual. I know that it costs uh, probably quite a lot and we have to change the whole model of our, our healthcare uh, system, probably in Europe, at least definitely in Estonia, but I think there's a lot of future in that. And I think we can look at um, different private clinics in United States like, um, uh, I can't remember the name right now, but anyway, there are Oliver, offerings. I think, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I, we are being uh, 
cool. Ping Sorry. by our organizing saying, your time is up, it's over. Look, my bad, I have not left time for Valtz or Elius, but you've done a great job already so far. Thank you all, Susan, Oliver, Elius, Valtz, for this nice conversation. We have to stop. Let's go back uh, to the general uh, audience. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. So welcome back to the our stage and I would like to thank the panelists and the moderators for very interesting uh, discussions which you have seen over the team streaming and uh, I take some reflections from them and uh, summarizing that healthcare data is saving lives and uh, the not sharing them across the borders or inside the countries is almost a criminal act so we need to find the ways to share them to tackle the diseases, rare diseases and, and regular ones. Imagine how that would help of uh, fighting the pandemia, because now we are shooting blindly uh, all around instead of uh, exchanging the healthcare data. Uh, semantics is key. And uh, if, we, if we use different semantics, then it's uh, difficult to understand each other, difficult to talk. And there was a reflection about UK leaving the EU so uh, and the uh, semantics in the health here. But, uh, you know, UK drives on the wrong side. They are using the wrong measurements like uh, feet and miles, uh, different from EU. Only one thing in UK is great. If you buy the beer by Pint, it's more than half a liter in uh, Germany. So semantics, I'm joking, of course, but... Uh, the semantics and the common uh, understanding what data needs to be exchanged is key. Also, it's uh, very important the demand side. And there was a good takeaway that, you know, the exchange between neighboring uh, countries is, uh, is, uh, has a better demand and better success rate than exchanging on the uh, countries where we have a less of economical activities with each other, even with the EU zone. So this idea of Baltics becoming the common space of uh, data economics and inter-exchangeability uh, inter and interoperability is, uh, is set to success. Then uh, there was also one, uh, uh, one uh, talking about uh, USA and EU legislation about technology superiority and everything. And uh, I, I have an example of not a very friendly country I mean, Russia, they have a law that they want to uh, the, do the import of the even on technology level, and they fail many, many years uh, miserably. So in the EU, we should not go the same path. So we need to use the technologies, advance, agree, and move on. On Gaia-X, Gaia-X uh, serves a supply side, and uh, we need uh, to increase the demand side, and it's a good platform. Also, the foundation uh, of digital transformation is legislation, but it should not be restrictive or it should be allow the innovations. So the business demand is the key and also their political will is the key. So I can assure that uh, associations, Infobalt, Licta and ITL will continue working to make a common data economy space in this region. We heard also that Finland is already joining forces with Estonia. We heard from Kaspers that uh, Denmark would be willingly to join. Let's take uh, Poland. And we are the big gang. We can, we can set, the, set the way forward. So thanks once again for watching. Uh, technically, for the ones who are on Teams Live, uh, you have seen both streams for the our uh, People who are watching through Delphi, Lithuania, Delphi, Estonia, uh, or uh, LMT Straume TV Net, then uh, the Gaia X uh, discussion and the uh, European Data Spaces Gaia X framework uh, panel will be streamed after my final word. So thanks for watching. Continue uh, your interest in data economy. Thanks for panelists. Thanks for the supporters of this conference. And uh, see you soon when the prime ministers will be signing the political will to make this real.
more consolidated and uh, frankly more impressive um, data sharing. consolidated and uh, frankly more impressive um, data sharing across Europe and a more impressive data economy based on that. And we're going to end up talking about GAIA-X and other European initiatives, but that's not where we're going to start. Instead, we're going to start at home with the experience that each of our countries has had. Because if we look at the, the data ecosystems, both the public and the private ecosystems in Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, and also in Finland, uh, we have very rich domestic data sharing. Um, now admittedly, for the most part, these are very nicely curated walled gardens. Um, so if we want to approach the question of how we move from our good examples of data sharing at home to a more federated, more collaborative European approach, we first should ask, what are the lessons we've learned at home? Uh, what has worked? And what is perhaps, what have the challenges been? What, is, what has it been difficult for us to do? And how can we learn from those challenges, learn from the bottlenecks we've had to overcome as we start looking at the question of pan-European data sharing. Now, to discuss these questions, we have a really fantastic panel here um, who can shed light on this, both from a public and a private perspective. First of all, we have Ilka Lakanyemi of the Gaia-X Hub of Finland. Uh, Ilka is also director of the Center for Knowledge and Innovation Research at Alto University, and he has a long career behind him at Nokia and many other tech companies. Then we have Rimantas Gilius, who is advisor to the Lithuanian Prime Minister on Digital Transformation, Open Data, Public Procurement, and their leverage on industrial policies. It's an impressive job title. Uh, Rimantas also has um, quite an interesting both public and private uh, career. He's been a minister uh, in government. Uh, he's also led uh, various tech companies of various sizes. Then we have uh, Gatis Ozans, um, from the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection and Regional Development of Latvia. Don't let the name fool you. They're also responsible uh, for uh, e-government, digitization, uh, and the digital economy. Uh, and Gatis uh, and I have worked together, I think it's almost a decade ago now, when I was still working for the Estonian government on uh, Estonian, Latvian, and pan-European data exchange. So he is an old, field, uh, an old hand in this field. And finally, last but not least, from Estonia, uh, my, also my good former colleague, Indrek Unnik, who is Global Affairs Director at the Government CIO Office and has really done a fantastic job in the last couple of years in building a lot of uh, international collaboration uh, in e-government for Estonia. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak initially for four or five minutes to start, start with some of the lessons that, uh, that they've learned at home. Um, and then to move from there to some initial thoughts on what successful pan-European collaboration would mean. Uh, and then as we move into the Q&A, we'll get more into GAIA-X specifically. Um, I've got some questions prepared, but please chime in with your questions. And then at the end, we'll ask each of the panelists for a 60-second wrap-up on what they have learned today, because this isn't just for the audience. This is also, I hope, an interesting conversation amongst the five of us. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask, first of all, our three current civil servants, uh, Rimantas, then Gatis, then Indek to speak, and then I will turn to Ilka, who can talk a little bit about what's, uh, what's going on with the Gaia-X hub in Finland. So please, Rimantas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be here uh, on the panel and to listen really to, um, uh, to hold the conference. Uh, so, answering uh, to your question about experiences, or uh, I would say it's twofold. Definitely, uh, as you mentioned, we see in our countries very nice examples, and I would say most of these nice examples or uh, inspiring examples are of the emerging new industries, kind of new startups, which feed themselves on data, yeah? I mean, who create themselves uh, economic space uh, via the data. What I believe we don't see so much is <clears throat> uh, how, uh, so these kind of startups, they didn't need to transform themselves. They are started from the, in the beginning, from, uh, uh, from the, yeah, uh, from the data uh, uh, and working there. But when we turn to 
legacy inter industries which kind of try to transform themselves via the data or specifically public sector, which uh, kind of where there are huge hopes about efficiencies of digitization. There are huge hopes of efficiencies of the easier, faster decisions on better informed decisions and so on. I think we don't see so much impressive uh, um, thing because to my understanding the digitization is easy in fact we have technologies we have um, uh, both in the hardware side both in, uh, in software side we do have understanding how to make processes and so on but when it comes to mindset this is something that doesn't work so well and I can tell from uh, my experience, very recent experience now in the government, that, uh, for example, I, I find this amazing, really. When uh, in COVID crisis, you know, we had very clearly uh, decisions needed to be to to be taken uh, very fast speed. So we have uh, recovery funds pushed to economy. So kind of finding the companies which need help so that they receive, um, well, aid packages and so on. And to understand that government is targeting right companies and it provides right impact, we need feedback about so how it goes. Yeah, how we deliver the aid, how kind of things change on the ground and so on. And the most probably often what I heard from institutions is when we say we need daily reports. They say, I mean, this is bureaucratic burden to provide you daily reports. You're interfering with our work. And to me, this is something like if our car speedometer would agree with us only to give us daily reports about what was our speed. I mean, it would not show us what, at what speed we are driving now, but it would show us only the report of the you know speed afterwards. So basically, I think the mindset, which uh, what I find is extremely, uh, or not maybe extremely difficult to change, but something that lags behind. And a few more things which I believe uh, are extremely important is that what we absolutely need in public sector, and we are working on that very intensely now in, in Lithuania, is that what we say, we need a strategic demand. It means that while public sector, while public sector may be reluctant or may not feel so pressed to provide data to uh, businesses, because I mean they uh, don't sometimes feel that they serve businesses in in the right way. But if government becomes the consumer of the of this data, I mean this kind of changes dynamics. And one more thing, what, what I find uh, with our enthusiasm that we don't have to push the limits too much, uh, kind of for our further discussion, I want to say that this open data, whatever data, what we, when we talk in a, in a bigger scale, we need to understand or we need to remember that we have to think about sustainability. It's like in agriculture. Uh, we can harvest too much so that land land gets get wasted, and we need to understand. And I think sovereignty is a bit about that in the bigger scale, but on the uh, uh, smaller scale, individuals and businesses have to retain control about the data they share and how it will be used and so on. But when we, you know, are very enthusiastic about the reuse of data and so on, we it's, it seems like interference to us that these guys who provided the, uh, our as data in the first place needs to be kind of in control of that. So maybe this is my um, a few remarks about not such an easy uh, subject probably for for the discussion. Thank you. And we're going to move uh, in a south to north direction. So uh, next up is Gatis, please. Uh, thank you, Lucas, and uh, appreciate to be here. Uh, currently in uh, Latvia, we have uh, uh, you know, under discussion the process of national digital strategy. And uh, uh, currently under the one of the key aspects or core dimensions 
uh, to enable uh, digital transformation of uh, Latvia for the next period is uh, development of the tech economy. And uh, from public sector side, uh, we see that uh, public sector side would have to play an important role to set up this uh, ecosystem to enable this data sharing uh, and data economy. And uh, to, uh, today, I would like to provide some uh, insights from the uh, more from the public uh, uh, public sector uh, view as enabler for uh, data economy. Uh, and currently, I think there is a, the, there is this, uh, the, 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 the bottom line that we currently see is uh, uh, at this moment we see uh, as this data ecosystem not uh, anymore in the context of only our national uh, national market or national ecosystem. We see it uh, already in in in, uh, in context of uh, EU single market and uh, in in such context we are uh, also approaching this aspect. But uh, if we we uh, talk about the existing uh, experience or uh, from existing data sharing. Uh, uh, ecosystem approach. I would like to highlight the three aspects. Uh, uh, one is uh, about data sharing culture, other one about centralization or open ecosystems, and the third one that was already just uh, touched already by colleague, uh, the dr dr uh, business not technology driven uh, approach. Regarding data sharing culture, uh, in Latvia, we have a long-lasting culture, and I think it's in the Nordic countries the common uh, for data sharing and the one's only principle among public sector participants. Uh, it's like a, we, we see it as a first generation where we have this one's only principle that uh, administrations are exchanging information among themselves to provide the, the high quality services for the citizens, for businesses, automatic tax reports, or procurement exclusion criteria, uh, criteria validation that happens automatically without need to, uh, uh, to submit some specific forms or documents or automatic entitlements. And, and we see that this integration internally was in the government as a first, first generation of, of, of data integration. Then, then, then come, came the second integration and uh, the second generation that's still in, 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 in process is opening data for the private sector to build uh, the public sector, uh, to build uh, research, to build the new products and services upon the public sector data. And, and, and we see that uh, now we are approaching the, the next phase uh, where we are speaking about those high value data sets, uh, the third generation where uh, data, the public and private data are shared with, within the common data spaces. So this, this uh, requires new, new mindset, new culture of uh, public private partnership also, it set up the new new requirements for security, for standardization, and uh, we see that this is uh, also from public sector side, like uh, the, the 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 challenge we have to address now at the moment, uh, from cultural perspective, but also the technically. The other aspect uh, I would like to touch is uh, centralization or open ecosystems. Uh, from our experience, uh, we see that. We need to have a combination of both of them and balance both of those approaches. Uh, from public sector uh, uh, perspective, we see that uh, there is a need for some level of centralization on government level to ensure that uh, efficient way of util utilizing those resources to decrease fragmentation and also increase interoperability of government as a single participant in these data ecosystems and data infrastructures, not as uh, like a uh, separated or very fragmented uh, separate institutions. So uh, this uh, fragmentation also uh, backfires us in, 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 in the sense of uh, the uh, availability of competence. So we need to uh, have this uh, concentration or at least specialization in government to uh, ensure high level of competence to work in, in these new uh, technologies and these new uh, dimensions. So, for example, uh, in Latvia, we currently are consolidating our government data centers into uh, national federated cloud. And uh, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, near future, we are looking forward to extend it by integration also with academic network to en enable the most of efficient uh, data processing. Uh, what we see is that uh, this can be well extended then to the European level for extra scal scalability and resilience. And, uh, and this, this takes the part of this consolidation of government side that, uh, to have this uh, uh, uniform approach. On the other hand, 
we see there is uh, uh, the same the same aspect as I mentioned, and to uh, extend to European level uh, requires this need to be open and need to be uh, open geographically, not limiting ourselves to national borders, but uh, being open and uh, exploiting the resources potential of uh, of computing or of data also residing in other countries, and also uh, being open uh, regarding the uh, sectors. Uh, from public and private sector. This is, I mentioned in the previous point, this is still, we have to learn uh, the approach, how to uh, combine and being open of exchanging data both ways from public to private and also from private to public sector. And uh, in this case, we see the standardization and especially the standardization of European level is, is essential to, to uh, ensure that we are, we are, uh, converging to uh, converge ecosystems, not of linking of completely different uh, different, uh, different systems or ecosystems. So uh, we see that there is a potential role also of uh, Gaia-X uh, to ensure this uh, across the sectors and across the, uh, the borders. And the third uh, uh, aspect I, I, I would like to um, mention that we had also that came into mind uh, regarding our experience uh, collaboration uh, collaborating with the Estonian colleagues of uh, joining together those data infrastructures uh, it, it's it's important to start not only from infrastructure point of view but also from uh, this uh, uh, biz business or or bi business case or uh, perspective the, the the needs perspective it's hard to uh, work just only on joining up infrastructures without seeing a, a specific purpose for that. And it, this was an uh, experience from ours, uh, I think from our uh, experience with Estonian colleagues that we, it takes, it took uh, quite a long time uh, until we, we, we managed to come together to, to work on a specific project to join our uh, data integrators together, but it, it only uh, allowed us to do that when we when we found some specific use cases to work on that in context of these so also in this case we see that it's essential to involve industry startups potential users of data and this data space approach is is a great driver for for this to to, to converge to these uh, convergent ecosystems and and we see that there is a potential uh, uh, of those data spaces which could drive the process uh, for example in in field of uh, European health data space, uh, particularly genomics, uh, biomedicine, where we see the Latvia, the, the Baltic states uh, uh, have an opportunity not only to drive the, this research and development process nationally, but also on, uh, on a global uh, scale innovations. So these were some three, three points that came um, as, 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 as uh, experience from our existing approach. Thank you, Rati. Indrek, I hand over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lucas, uh, for the previous introduction and your kind words, as well as uh, thank you, Rimantas and uh, Katis, for, for the insights you've given. Um, apparently, you've already discussed the topics that I wanted to discuss, so I have the difficult task of uh, finding some new aspects uh, that I've come up with here. Uh, but you're not the only ones who've done that to me. Also, my dear minister and also uh, our head of uh, statistics, Estonia, already mentioned the things that I wanted to mention in previous panel. Uh, and keynotes, but that's okay. So before we take a look towards the future, uh, towards SkyX, uh, as Lucas mentioned, we maybe want to reflect on, on the basics and, and what we've learned from, from uh, certain aspects of it. So from my side, maybe an, another added aspect that I want to bring in here is, is that uh, we see that uh, the first steps when we're talking about uh, data sharing uh, between government institutions and, and private sector, the, the foundation of digital transformation in general is legislation and regulations. However, the legislation shouldn't be restrictive nor an excessive burden to follow rather than a set of guidelines, uh, principles, technical standards, just as Scott has also mentioned, that gives us an opportunity to, for open market competition as well as solutions. And, and in theory, those uh, solutions could be interchangeable, interoperable, provide the, the end users the ability to change between those solutions when they feel that it's necessary. And, and the, on the other aspect, uh, when we talk about today's age as well, when we talk about cloud computing, we talk about artificial intelligence, which both are very much linked to data. 
to foster innovation, we need to refrain in excessively restricting uh, regulations. So, so also to help to innovate ourselves, we have to make sure that the safeguards are there to a certain extent, but at the same time that we also provide a, a good uh, environment for, for innovation. The second thing uh, that I also want to maybe bring up here is, is the once-only principle as well as the responsibility of data, meaning that, of course, citizens, entrepreneurs should only be, uh, need to provide information once for authorities. And, and after that, the data should be um, exchanged between those authorities. However, gathering the information and, and also keeping it safe is, is a responsibility that needs to be looked at. Uh, safe, secure, and also in that sense updated when we talk about also high-value high data sets, uh, it, it has to be updated. Um, so, so that's maybe, maybe another aspect that I wanted to bring out here today, uh, which also links together very well with the once-only principle is something that we have been very firm believers here in Estonia. It's, it's, it's about what do we actually exchange? And, and when we look in a broader perspective, a European view, then there is still a lot of talk about documents. We, we don't really believe that uh, exchanging documents is necessary, nor should it be necessary. We should be talking about data and only data. Uh, our perspective is that if, if uh, authorities need information, they don't need the, the frame of a document around it. We just need to have, first of all, of course, semantic interoperability but also uh, we need to really focus on not the minimum requirement rather than the maximum. What can we do? And where the document, exchanging documents is the minimum, we can see that, that exchanging data is, is actually towards what we should uh, strive. Now, mm, another aspect that has already been mentioned as well, maybe by Remontas, uh, by bringing in the aspect of changing the mindset and, or shift in mindset, but also in terms of Katis, when he brought that up the aspect of Estonia and Latvia working together, finding use cases to uh, data exchange, we need to really have as many stakeholders as possible uh, um, being part of this data economy. And one part that we see where we can engage the individuals in our country is actually providing them with the necessary tools to access their information, to make decisions with their uh, information, but also to guarantee that we actually know who is behind the computer. And, and as you've already guessed, I'm talking about uh, a strong, secure, well-distributed digital identity that we need to have so that the entrepreneurs can do their job, so that the citizens, residents uh, of our countries can actually do what they intend to do with their information. And, and this brings us to the next step, which is uh, looking towards the future. And when we're talking, we have already set up a seamless public service implementation plan in Estonia, uh, starting from childbirth and starting business, purchase, purchasing cars, searching for jobs and etc. cetera. Uh, we, we need to have the tools, or we need to provide the individuals with the tools to actually use those services. Because if we build these services, but there are no one uh, to use them, then the question is, what is the point, right? Have we actually done our job? I, I don't think so. So uh, tools to, to have access to that. And maybe to, to starting to sum up here, the first um, intervention, um, Kat has already brought this also, is, is cross-border cooperation. Mm, it, it seems like a huge task. When we talk about the European Union, we're talking about uh, 27 different countries. But it doesn't have to be as big of a task if you start with smaller steps. Uh, our minister already brought out the aspect of Estonia and, and Finland exchanging data cross-border as of last year regarding our business registries. Katis brought out the fact that we have been in deep discussions and finding use cases how Estonia and, uh, and Latvia can do that together and not even with the same data exchange layer, but linking them together in a federated way, which is possible, right? So, so starting with small steps and setting certain principles, setting certain standards, uh, everything is possible. And, and I'm actually looking very much forward to, to the future of EU and actually to the fact that not only will I be able to one day, hopefully, 
to, uh, go work in Riga or go work in Vilnius, and the only thing that I take with me is is some luggage and bed sheets uh, for my new apartment, but and everything else will move seamlessly. But the same will happen in in Italy. The same will happen in uh, in Germany. The same will happen in Portugal if I move there. So this is this is my small little dream for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Indra. And now, last but not least, we're going to move across the bay to Helsinki. Um, actually, I don't know if you're in Helsinki right now, Ilka, but, uh, but anyways, either way to, to Finland. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. I'm actually in downtown Helsinki. I live very close to the harbor. So very, very nice thing that says. Uh, and many thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a, it's a, been a good panel discussion, and I, I fully agree with everything that has been said already. So it's about mindsets, it's about understanding, about the use cases, it's about working together with the public and the private sector. And I think that's that's very kind of the key essence that we need to have in place in order to move forward here. Uh, my role within the Finnish Gaia X hub is talking to the companies and talking to the industries and trying to make them to understand that what they can gain and achieve by participating in, in, in a Gaia X hub activities and then also what they can look forward uh, with Nordic and uh, Nordic Baltic cooperation and at the same time also what will be the kind of the impact that they can have in the EU EU arena around the topic. Uh, but since I come from business school, I, I, I have to say that when, when I talk to the company executives, uh, it's all about the business case and less about data. So data is a tool, and 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 then you have to approach the the uh, the company perspective from the point of view that you have to talk about growth opportunities for their existing business. So what is the incremental value that they get from using the data and utilizing that in a different way? And then you can talk about what are the radical aspects, what are the things that they have not already done before. Because since the 1970s and the 1980s, the companies have been sharing data. So it's nothing new to them in that sense. And, and then primarily it has taken place in their supply chains and the value networks and, and really, really kind of uh, trying to be as efficient and uh, as possible and optimize the business processes and, and do that. But now we are reaching a level of technology maturity where we have huge amounts of computing power. We have new data analytics tools. We have also uh, capabilities that never existed before that by utilizing those, you can actually do much more than you previously did with data. And that's that's where, where the radical part comes in. And, and that's where the, the companies are looking towards also the public sector that work with us to realize that what needs to happen not only in the business case development, but for instance, in the capacity development and the skills development within within the countries, so that we will have the workforce for the future, and that we will have all, all everything else that is required from for the companies to what the company executives call the enabling business environment. So Gaia X is part of that enabling business environment. We need to understand where the regulatory trends are moving. We need to understand what are the directives coming from Brussels and how they will impact the, the running of the businesses. So that's the first first step why companies and then businesses are interested in, in, in data sharing and data, data utilization and do that matter Gaia X. Uh, then secondly, uh, like I said, companies have been doing a lot of pilots and a lot of projects around data sharing. And, and there are here in Finland, we have worked together with uh, different institutions and research organizations that what do you need to have in place in order to make value out of sharing the data? So what are the different things that you, you, you really need to understand about the ownership, the IPR issues and all, all of that? And, and, and then uh, since that has already been done, but it has primarily been done within their own verticals, within their own supply networks, and not that much around cross 
sectoral uh, usage. So that cross-sectoral part is the, is the radical part. How we combine public data with the private sector data and then how, how do you make that match in a way that it creates new opportunities uh, around the topic. That's that's a very valuable uh, thing to, to go forward with. And, and then uh, also, uh, the, the idea about scaling what we already know, what it is that we have already done. And I think the Gaia X network with the hubs spurring in, in, in different parts of the member states, they actually give that uh, idea of scaling the best practices that have already been done to other countries and thus creating more market demand for the data sharing and for using the data in different use cases and in different business contexts. In, in that sense. And then again, it, it's about uh, co-innovation and co-creation. Uh, companies have been fairly good, I would say, in some cases extremely good at working with the, with the companies they know. Uh, so other, other companies in the same line of business or, or as I said, part of the, the old value network that they had. But they are less capable of working with the unknowns so, so the companies that they don't know, the businesses, they don't understand that well. And that's where ecosystem building comes to picture. So you have to be able to talk to different companies. You, you have a pool of data. And then that data comes from different sources. And then you need to understand that what is the uh, objective for each of the partner within the ecosystem to make value out of that data. And then you can have people there that were previously competitors to you in, in, in a business area. And you have to be able to come up with the, with, with the kind of the management and the governance structure that how you deal with that same pool of data and make business in, in both cases. Uh, in, in there, so I, I think the, it's a it's a fascinating time. I, I, I really see Gaia X and I see the other data initiatives as a uh, a step to to a bit of a more uncertain business world, but at the same time, it creates a lot of opportunities. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pick on each one of our panelists with one targeted question, and while I'm doing that. I asked the audience also to think of questions, um, and I believe you can put them in the chat, and I will then uh, have those questions uh, showing up in front of my screen. Uh, and, uh, and after I've asked my questions, we'll also open it up for our panelists to question each other. So we're going to go in the same order, um, and I want to start with Ramanta. So, you know, I really like the way that you use this phrase of strategic demand. Um, as something that you're trying to build right now in Lithuania and that we need to really drive the use cases. And it's about the business, you know, a point we all made that it's about the business case mm -hmm. and not just about having the technological infrastructure. So if you're looking at demand more broadly than Lithuania, but demand for data in Lithuania, where do you see that? Is it driven by public sector use cases regionally, by, by the EU level, maybe European regulation? Is it driven by commercial parties that want data that's either in, in your government's hands or maybe that's sort of sitting in private silos in Lithuania? Where is that strategic demand from outside of Lithuania coming from, if it's coming? Yeah, um, thank you very much. I, I think, to my understanding, strategic demand is or should be a very conscious endeavor, kind of. And I believe um, what for example, what um, Estonian minister presented as uh, this uh, CMR uh, uh, well project. This is an example of, to my understanding, extremely good well implementation of idea of the strategic demand. So uh, governments with stakeholders in a regional setting, so they basically are not dreaming about pan-European ECMR in 10 years' time, but making it happen in several important countries where it makes sense and wh where we can do that. So in that way, to my understanding, there are a number of things like power markets, like uh, medical uh, uh, secondary kind of uh, reuse of medical information and so on, where we don't just need to talk about let's share everything. I mean, let's share everything doesn't work. 
but when we put kind of pressure on kind of comprehending a business case where it seems it, it will not benefit the world, I mean, it will not only benefit the world, but it will benefit us. That's, to my understanding, the uh, good example of the, uh, uh, the strategic de demand setting. What comes to European Union overall, I, despite working in, in government for quite some years, I don't really grasp how it really works in this big scale. I mean, I mean, with this, I mean, we know it goes, I mean, it achieves results, but how it's really leveraged, uh, to my understanding, what there are efficient mechanisms, definitely, and we see this implementation in probably in data spaces, for example, or in this kind of initiatives, where uh, European Union cannot create strategic demand as such because it does not really need much. It's kind of not uh, very, well, I mean, it's supranational body in that way, but to my understanding, it can foot the bill kind of, it creates demand, not by demanding, but by purchasing this kind of demand. So by saying we are creating something from in medical spaces, and if you do this, if you share data with this kind of things, we foot the bill, That's that creates another business case, another motivations, which hopefully can uh, further on will develop into something sustainable. Thank you. So, Gatis, let's let's talk about the European element a bit. Um, I know that you've been involved in quite a few European initiatives and projects, uh, and you talked about standardization as being one of the things we need to do. So I just want to ask you, frankly, you know, when, when you see Brussels, or it doesn't have to be Brussels, it could be some kind of more voluntary working group or initiative trying to standardize things, is that a level up? Is it raising the bar? Or is it sometimes the case that to actually make it possible for data formats to work between Latvia and Italy and Portugal and Sweden, that you actually have to lower the bar and you go down to the lowest common denominator and you maybe sometimes lose some of the richness of the data or the nuance of what you have in your ecosystem. It's probably a little bit of both, but how do you see that dynamic playing out so far in, in attempts to standardize at a European level? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just thank you for the question. I think it's re re relevant at the moment. Uh, as we see it in, in, uh, nationally, we see it, it, the standardization in, in any case is essential to have this uh, common baseline for all the participants and all the parties from, uh, if we look on the European uh, scale, it's, uh, it's re re required to have this common denominator for all the member states. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, we have uh, set it also in, on, on a regulation that in our uh, e-government architecture that uh, in the cases when we have this European level standards or, uh, or international standards, we have to work ac uh, according to those uh, standards and uh, some specific uh, uh, specific uh, solutions can be made only if, if no standardization is in, in, in place. Uh, at the same time, uh, it, it shows that not always uh, uh, it's enough with these standards, but then we approach them as a, as a baseline. We have to uh, ensure that to, 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 to have this uh, interoperability with other participants. But we have, uh, for example, on electronic identification in, uh, in our region, uh, Baltics, Nordics, we have some specific on, on uh, uh, view how we identify people and how we exchange the identification data and then what kind of information we hold about the person. And then, then we see that uh, uh, the st standards that are provided on European level is not enough for us to ensure this once only principle or the, the way how we provide services for our citizens uh, locally. So here we are uh, having also some uh, joint groups on uh, Nordic Baltic level where we discuss those additions or, or, or extensions of those standards provided by Europe. I think uh, I think it's it's uh, it's essential to have such uh, take into account the, some specific regional uh, nuances, but still you have to be in 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 uh, also called this the general line to to be interoperable with uh, other countries as well. I, I, it's an interesting hybrid approach. Um, Indic, the EU, uh, you know, the, the current commission has made the data economy a top priority. But a year ago, they launched a data strategy uh, and uh, all of the sort of work by Gaia-X is paralleled by legislation uh, and some soft policy work coming out of Brussels. 
What do you make of that? And in particular, what do you make of the, the regulations around data sharing um, and, and public sector access to data? Uh, is it just right? Is it too much or is it not enough? Well, um, it's it's uh, always an interesting question in a sense to what do you think of uh, what the EU is doing? And I'll start with the with the aspect of the EU is not doing anything. We are doing it in the EU. So this we are the ones that actually uh, are are trying to direct the regulations the way that we see see fit. Um, and and of course, as there are different member states, they have different perspectives. And then at some point, uh, some might have uh, feel. Uh, the need to have more restrictive measures where others have different opinions. And, and I believe the past or the last point that Kat is also brought out is a good, uh, good example of that. In, when some things are done already in, in certain regions of the EU and there is some, some know-how, there is some, some expertise in the field, then it's all, always beneficial if, if uh, we share these knowledges and help to direct the regulations in a way that we see that will have actually real-life uh, implications. And, and when, in general, we look at the processes and, and the last statements that have been coming from the European Union, then it's it's really all good in a sense that uh, when we talk about the digital compass initiative for example uh, then there's open consultation with the european commission there's bilateral discussions with the member states there's uh, you know uh, this uh, back to forth uh, uh, interactions where where we can give our input and and when we take a look from on, on previous regulations starting from the eidas regulation for example um, uh, then, then uh, that, that's maybe another, I'd say, a good example of uh, if something has been done and some aspects of it, of it didn't come out as expected, then there's always an opportunity for reviewing. The essence of uh, reviewing is okay, but at the same time, we shouldn't strive or, or work towards reviewing always rather than coming out with a regulation that is uh, already very well done and thinks about the implementation aspects of the regulation as well. Not only what it uh, enables to do, but at some point what it gives us guidelines that should be a minimum level of that is done. For example, providing a minimum level of, of high, minimum level of high level uh, secure digital identities for each European uh, uh, citizen. Uh, also, when, when you, you, you talked about the, the acts or regulations that uh, deal with uh, data economy. And, and when, when we look at the Data Governance Act, for example, uh, our, our feeling again here is that it shouldn't be, uh, I'm not saying that it is, but I'm saying that it shouldn't be focusing on demands and restrictions rather than guarantee the necessary stimulus to enhance what we are looking for. Uh, data exchange, focus more interoperability, etc. And, and, and this all goes together with all of the regulations in light of new technologies where they should be, in, in essence, when we talk about AI, for example, technology neutral and, and principle based, something that also got this mentioned, I believe, and, and uh, enable us to link together different aspects and different technological solutions, which don't have to be identical, but have to have the capacity of interoperability built into them. Uh, thanks. Thank you. I, I, I picked up on some very gentle, very diplomatic critiques there too. Um, Ilka, uh, uh, Kayax, you know, we've all talked about business cases, um, demand side. At the same time, you know, as I followed the project, the initial work was very technical. It's about setting up standards, um, you know, infrastructures and so on. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit, how the, the demand side is coming together in Kayax because, as I said initially, it looked more like it was uh, the supply side, but I'm sure that that is evolving as things develop. Well, I have to, have to go back a little bit in my, my history when I was working for Nokia, and, and I'm not an engineer by training, I'm an economist. And, and, and when you talk to the engineers, it's all about uh, inventing the next device or the next technology, and then you start thinking about that who would use it and for what purpose. So uh, that, that's the kind of the regular mindset, what, what you have in place in, in many areas. But at the same time, uh, I, 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 I would take it back a little bit, maybe five, six years ago, 
uh, there started to be a, a project in, in, in Europe called uh, International Data Spaces Association, which is the, uh, the secret source, as they themselves call for, for GAIA-X. And, and ba basically that exercise was led by researchers, by academia, by companies participating in the work and then really trying to come up with new ways of enabling the, uh, the data usage for companies and, and for the private sector uh, at large. And basically what was done in there was exactly what my colleagues here in the panel were saying. They, they, they were looking for what type of technology architecture or framework you need to have in place in order to not only to share the data, but to find the data, to have the data in a such quality that you are able to to do something with it. And, 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 and also to think about that you don't necessarily need to open all the data from the companies, but you only open that part of data that is needed for a specific industrial context, for instance. And then you can do it on a temporary basis as well. You don't have to kind of allow the access to data all the time. You can do it that it's it's real time and it's based on a, a certain case as such. And when that work really kind of a progress, it, 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 it led to a situation where uh, the demand within the companies and the private sector was was slowly growing. And, and I would say much more than just the Supply, but it's about getting more understanding also about the customers and then also the users and, and what, how they use the, in the end product, in this case the car, and, and what type of different information you can get from them with the consent of the users. So you're talking about trusted interactions of the data based on the European values that we heard in the previous panel. And then I think that's, that, that's where we are at this stage, that we are kind of having a mature enough architecture for, for, for uh, handling the data through not only through the International Data Spaces Association, but through other initiatives as well from in, in the background as a kind of a technology cap, uh, capabilities. And then now Gaia X together with the commercial interests of the companies is, is starting to slowly create, and I'm not saying slowly, is that Gaia X is not going to be overnight thing. It will take time to, to kind of come to fruition. But at the same time, um, you, you, you're starting to create more of this demand for the interoperability of the data using horizontal platforms to, to, uh, to bring different verticals together. And then, like I said in my previous uh, intervention, is that you're starting to have these emerging opportunities for cross-sectoral usage of the data. So whether it's weather data or whatever, but whatever works for for the for the business case of the company is to come up with the new type of a context. That's kind of a long long intervention in there, but I would like to take it away from this kind of a traditional thing that let's build something and then hope that someone will use it. In this case, we, we're really looking into the, the usage part as well. So it's, it sounds like it's a fairly iterative approach then. Yes, it is. So I have a couple of questions here, um, and I don't think everyone needs to answer every question. Some of them are, are pretty clearly, some people, some are a little more open. Um, first one, with the development of AI, people can be re-identified from open data sets, for instance, from, from medical research data. How do you see privacy protection in a pan-European data environment? Um, is it possible, from, purely from a technical perspective, to ensure full privacy? Uh, yeah, maybe, if I may, a very small comment from my side. I understand that when we talk about larger scales, this is where we can hide the data. I mean, where we can really uh, make it more uh, impersonal 
rather than uh, when we have a small country like Lithuania. I mean, with rare diseases, you definitely will be able to, without AI, even identify uh, uh, some of the patients. So basically, to my understanding that this, one of the things is that bigger regions have much bigger, um, uh, well, both attractions and kind of uh, economy of scale. But on the uh, uh, what probably the other thing what uh, what I wanted to mention was that uh, it, this um, application or uh, that staying uh, as I said in control to my understanding is um, well, yeah uh, it, it still remains an uh, important question of so GDPR kind of frames this uh, um, reality but uh, uh, to my understanding what's extremely important to say is that we don't know there's no best framework we don't know it mm. yet how to make things right so I uh, liked a lot what Ilka was talking about kind of this iterative approach of how we develop things and we need to recognize that we are developing things with data I mean we by doing
an AI project, and and, and there we talk about the uh, the kind of the, what what do you need to have really in place, whether it's the semantic capability or or, or really trying to understand that where that data is that we will use for for creating a universal platform for the purposes of AI, for instance. And and um, yes, it, 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 it is a challenge. Let, let's put it that way. Uh, there 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 are not kind of a easy easy ways of of going going about it, but. Uh, Going back to the time when when the internet uh, was was slowly becoming a kind of a method for for running your business and building your business, there was a lot of talk about semantic web, and there was a lot a lot, a lot of uh, MIT research and European research working on that topic. So, so basically, uh, that is being now discovered and being researched by by different universities and different partners. Uh, so what I, what we know from the company point of view is that there will be answers at some point, but currently it, it is a bit of a question mark. Yes. Mm. Gatis, any views on that? No, no specific things to add, but of course the semantic interoperability is one of the greatest challenge for us in in European uh, Union, and uh, I think the one of the approach is how it's been solved is. Uh, on a pan uh, that helps to address this aspect is when we are having these pan-European level uh, kind of initiatives, projects which are not merging together the national kind of the, the data sets or national uh, services, but they are uh, building the European level. For example, uh, now it's built on on the health sector this inf uh, information on uh, on patient pre prescriptions. And it will be built on European level, so it doesn't require for us to synchronize our local. So it, maybe this is an approach how we can uh, how we can better uh, approach this uh, challenge of, uh, of of semantic interoperability rather than trying to change the national uh, interoperability kind of um, framework for for all 27 member states. Up, and I've gotten the one minute warning. I thought I had till 140, but I guess not. Um, so that means that you're all going to be robbed of your 30 second summaries. Although if you, maybe if the moderators or the organizers give me another, give us another few seconds, we can do those. But look, my wrap up, I think is very clear. We have some real strong consensus on the fact that this, uh, ambition of pan-European data sharing, um, can only work if we really have business incentives aligned, uh, with what's happening on a technical level. Uh, the technological components are there. Um, both in terms of what's been done nationally, what projects the kayaks are working on, what's what's their kind of in the toolbox of European things. Um, but we need to get the business case, both public and private sector together. And, um, you know, business cases can come from the private sector that can also come from the public sector. Uh, we, we didn't have a chance to talk about COVID and our COVID responses um, today. But I think if we started looking at everything we've experienced in the last year, we would see many, many examples where public sector or broadly the public interest has had a need for uh, better regional pan-European um, data sharing. And the last point maybe uh, is an idea I heard from several people, which is it's not just national versus European. There's some intermediate levels and that the uh, sort of the regional level, whether that's just Baltic or Nordic Baltic, uh, can be a really fruitful um, domain to organize these things. And so that since I'd say, uh, Ilka, um, good luck to you with... Uh, with the Finnish hub. Um, I hope that uh, we find various ways of network networking Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania into your work into the other guy X hubs, maybe setting one up regionally. And I hand us back to the organizers who I suppose are going to um, shunt us back into the conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Likewise. Very good. Thank you.